Good evening and welcome to the public meeting of the Halton District School Board for Wednesday, November the 6th, 2019. At this moment, I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is video voice recorded and live streamed on the hdsb.ca website. I would also like to ask that you turn any of your devices to silent mode. All trustees are present. Uh, Trustee Collard is on the phone. And all superintendents are present this evening. They'll say some may be out of the room. <clears throat> so, uh, Treaties Recognition Week 2019 runs from November 4th to 10th. The Halton District School Board is committed to ensuring our staff and students are provided with meaningful opportunities to learn about the importance of treaties. The land and treaty acknowledgement used by the Halton District School Board was first developed with the elders, knowledge guides, and guidance from Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This statement recognizes the historical and current treaty relationships in the area the Halton District School Board encompasses. It is important for everyone to understand the significance of treaties, that they are applicable today and that they ensure the rights of many First Nations peoples. As part of honoring our commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action and Treaties Recognition Week, Halton the Halton, Dis sorry, <coughs> Halton District School Board schools have been asked to display the flag of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in their buildings. The flag is also currently on display at JW Singleton Center. This evening, Vice Chair L. Harrison will be honoring the land. Thank you. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Atawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, lands, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walk before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. Thank you. Are there any declarations of possible conflict of interest? Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Trustee Daniele. Seconded by uh, Trustee Rocha. Is there any discussion at all on the agenda? Seeing none. All those in favor of approving the agenda. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we are up to the Inspire Awards. So everyone in the Halton District School Board community can nominate or be nominated families, neighbors, related organizations, staff, students, and school volunteers. The Inspire Award is given to an individual or group that is formally or informally associated with the Halton District School Board who support our students and their achievements through exemplary caring, initiative, innovation, and creativity. <coughs> award recipients choose where they'd like to receive their award, and this evening we have two Inspire Award presentations. I am going to actually pass the gavel over to Vice Chair Al Harrison at this point. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my honor to uh, do this, um, these readings this evening. Would I please, uh, would Danielle Barbu from J.W. Boych Public School please come on up uh, and join uh, Chair Grabenz? And let me tell you a little bit about Danielle. Welcome. Danielle is an elementary teacher at J.W. Boych Public School. Students and their families appreciate Danielle's out-of-the-box teaching method and how she goes above and beyond to make students feel comfortable and supported. Danielle is often incorporating outside learning and mindfulness activities to support students and their learning. 
Parents and guardians value how Danielle makes every effort to involve them in their child's learning and progress at school. Danielle's dedication to her students and their families ensures student success and helps build students' self-esteem and their confidence. Uh, and I would just like to ask Trustee Collard also to um, say a few words at this point in time. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair Al Harrison. Um, Danielle, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Orchard community for all that you do to help our students feel welcome and comfortable, present and mindful of the activities that they're doing while they're in your, in your classroom. I'm sure that it's something that they will learn to use um, beyond the classroom in their lives as they, as they move through life. And I just wanted to thank you very much um, for all that you do. Thank you so much. And I know you've got some special fans in the audience, so if you want to come closer and get some great pictures, please feel free to do so. There's a, a very special young lady in a red dress that we'd like to welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, I would like to invite Laura Clement to come on up. Laura is from M.M. Robinson High School. Laura is the social worker at M.M. Robinson. She's a tremendous support to many students and their families. She continuously goes above and beyond to ensure students and their families have the resources they need to ensure that students can learn in a supportive environment. She's a liaison for students and ensures their best interest and well-being remains the highest priority. Her reassuring, supportive demeanor is a comfort to the students and families that she works with. So I want to, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. And at this time, I believe that we'd like to invite uh, everyone back up and trustee, or sorry, Director Miller as well. So Danielle, if you wouldn't mind coming back up. And to the wonderful gentleman that was uh, trying to take your picture earlier, please feel free to come on back and, and there's another opportunity with uh, Chair Grabenson and Director Miller. Thank you so much. And uh, there were also some Inspire Awards winners who chose, it was a Inspire Award winner who chose to receive her award, his award at, um, at another location. Let me tell you who that was. John Horner is a community member associated with the Halton Learning Foundation and a former teacher at Milton Districts High School. And uh, this month we also honor him for uh, being an inspiring individual. Okay, uh, and just a reminder that we do accept uh, nominations for the Inspire Award every month. Just go right onto our website, search up Inspire Award and uh, all the information is there. Okay, so next we're up, uh, we have no delegations this evening but we do have two presentations. The first 
is the Burlington PAR implementation update. Superintendent Blackwell, welcome. I sense you have a bunch of people with you. So I am going to clear myself away from the table in a second. What I would like to do is acknowledge that we have too many people here to put around this table, uh, but we have Principal McClellan, uh, we have Vice Principal Dawson, we have Hilary Rivett, who is one of the iSTEM faculty, she's a science teacher. We have Sarah Cunningham, who is the design tech teacher, or tech design teacher, sorry. And we have, I'll turn it over to Jamie Mitchell, who is behind me. We will share a little update around iSTEM, and then we'll have trustees have the opportunity to ask questions, and then I'll continue with the update after that. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Bitchell. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Jamie. Um, one of the four leaders involved with uh, iSTEM this year and the implementation. I could, I could talk about what we're doing, but we have a little video we put together a few weeks ago, so I think I'd rather just show that. So I'm gonna get Foz to press play and full screen that. I don't know if you can all see.
Attorney Black will ask us to come and talk about the implementation of the Carrie, can you use the microphone? Huh? Oh, there. You're, you're a good thing you're an ISTEM student. <laughs> There's Hansa <Hamza> Charm. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Um, we thought we'd have the students talk about the program rather than us telling you what we're doing because the program is pretty phenomenal and I think these three here are here to articulate what they're learning in the program. So, Claus, you're going to do the introductions? There's a hand there. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Foz Mayfield. To my right is Jackson, and to my left is Isla. Thank you for having us today to present about the iSTEM program. We are all students in the program, and we're here to share a few things we find essential and favorable about iSTEM. What brought me to the program was my interest in it, an activity in technology and engineering. I aspire to maintain a career in those fields one day, and I feel iSTEM is going to help me get there. Since I've got here, we've been introduced to prototyping techniques, innovation plans, data collection, and many more skills that an engineer would use every day. iSTEM has given me a new way to look at problems with handy resources such as our 3D printer, laser cutter, innovation room, prototyping room, and many more to come. We've already taken two trips to McMaster to focus on our project, finished an interactive rocket prototyping assignment, and started working on preventing the erosion in the ravine behind our school. ISEM has truly brought life to my thinking and is now helping me grow and learn as a student. I've decided to apply to Eldershot's ISTEM program because I knew that I wanted to be an electric or chemical engineer, and I knew that this program would help me on my journey. In the ISTEM program, the focus is making young, innovative engineers so that they can grow up and become very successful. Despite the distance and taking the GO train every morning, ISTEM is a different type of learning, and it's innovative, more hands-on, and overall so much fun, and I would not change that for anything. In an ISTEM school day, we usually have two of our ISTEM classes, which is either science, technology, geography, or math. It depends on what projects we have going on. Sometimes we mix two of our cohorts, and it gives us an opportunity to work with other students, expand our learning, and get creative with new people that we wouldn't normally learn with. I personally prefer, well, <laughs> this, work, this works well in our program since we do a lot more projects, which I personally prefer, especially since the assignments are mostly on current events. For example, our ravine erosion or aquatic houses. As I said before, the program is a much more hands-on. So instead of just sitting down in a classroom writing notes, we get to go outside, find things around us that relate to topics we're learning about then add them to our lessons. That adds variety to our daily lessons. Often we do a lot of group work within our own cohorts. We rarely are put in the same groups with the same people we already worked with. And sometimes our teacher choose our groups or sometimes we get to choose our own groups. Either way, we get diverse pool of ideas, opinions, and creativity that takes a level of our, any project from good to great. In iSTEM, we learn a lot of things, but in an interesting way. Like when we did our rockets, every little detail tied into tech, math, science, and geography. I personally prefer handing in one big project than four different projects, especially since when you're an engineer, you have no choice but to add all those elements anyways. I'm also very excited about our McMaster project. It's very interesting and exciting to help a real person that could benefit from our work. Going to a university, sitting in on lectures while just in grade nine is really motivating to me. I wanted to go to McMaster ever since I went to, I attended my first day at camp there three years ago. I honestly love the opportunities that the ISEM program provides to me. I'm not only excited about this year, but even more excited about next year's focus as I hear is about entrepreneurship. I am here tonight to share with you how iSTEM has helped me with my ADHD. ADHD is Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, and for me it means that sitting still for extremely long, uh, extended periods of time is extremely hard. 
Paying attention can also be very hard for me. It's sometimes hard to stay still, uh, to stay focused on a subject. For me and other people with ADHD, it can be common that when something grabs our attention or interest, it becomes all that we can focus on. This is called hyperfocusing. Sometimes this can cause lack of sleep or even seeming more distracted. People think it's a bad thing, but if hyperfocusing is related to a school project, it can be really, it can actually be really good. I experience hyperfocusing in my personal life, but rarely in school until this year in ISTEM. Now I've already experienced it twice, and it's only the beginning of November. For me, ISTEM is about hands-on activities and interactive lessons. This style of learning greatly increases the amount of time I can focus on a topic that I'm not interested in. It also allows me to focus in classes and take the correct notes. I like that ISTEM classes are usually hands-on and interactive. I find classes outside of ISTEM are often long and boring, and they can cause me to daydream and not take notes. On October 24th, we had a math class, but instead of sitting there and learning formulas and taking notes, we were given little cubes that can connect to each other. This particular lesson was on a volume and surface area of 3D objects. We were given 24 of these cubes. We each had to make a shape and then share our shapes with the class. We then took those shapes and made a chart with them, and then we used the chart to create formulas and figure out the volume and surface area of the shapes. This kind of learning uh, supports my ADHD uh, wide brain. Thank you for listening to us. We also have gifts. <laughs> Carrie just asked me if I want to talk. I don't know what else to say after that. So I think we can, oh, there is an open house for uh, interested iSTEM families uh, next week, uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Sorry, 7 p.m., 7.30, and 8 p.m. Sure. So what, uh, what the students are handing out are um, some stickers that were made on our laser cutter. It was um, like a labor of love over the last couple of days, right, Sarah? Um, and we finally got the laser cutter hooked up so we could use it safely, and we knew we wanted to start producing things right away. So is, is it actually wood on the front? Is that a wood veneer? Yeah, so it's mahogany on the front, so it's, I think it smells nice. Um, but they are a sticker, and you can stick them to your laptops or, or whatever you want. Yes. Okay, so Terry says you might have questions, so we can take some questions. The students would love to answer questions, too. Director Miller? I'd just like to make a comment before the trustees ask questions. Uh, when it was first uh, brought forward to this Board of Trustees around doing a thematic approach at Aldershot High School, uh, it, it's, these trustees embraced that idea and, and it supported the work of staff, um, in particular Superintendent Terry Blackwell, in helping create this. Uh, many superintendents were involved, but it was led by Terry Blackwell. Um, in supporting this, and the iSTEM came from the community, uh, the school community and the parent community. It's so gratifying, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful because this Board of Trustees took a leap of faith with iSTEM, and uh, I want to thank the staff of Aldershot for making this work. Sitting here listening to this, you know, uh, we went through some challenging times, shall we say. When you see this, it makes all the challenging times worthwhile. Uh, so I really want to thank the staff, but you pale compared to the thanks I want to give to the kids and the students. You are the ones that this program is successful, and I want to thank you for what you're doing and what you're doing here in promoting it. So you're, you're leading education, so thank you. And thank you. <laughs> so we have a, a growing speakers list here, Trustee Amos. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you for coming out and sharing first why you wanted to be part of this uh, program and what you've already learned from it. it I mean, it's really exciting. Um, when you were in elementary school before you decided to take this step, did any of you get exposure to any type of tech programs? Uh, not inside of school normally. It would always be outside of school that I'd be taking part in tech activities or anything of that sort. What I do? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I consider myself a huge tech and tech enthusiast in general. Um, I have a course running online. It's pre-recorded on the fundamentals of Java. You can find them on Udemy.com. I presented a course at Waterloo Tech Waterloo once wow. under Shopify's name. It was on 
again, the development of the course. I'm working on some businesses outside of school on drop shipping and again with Shopify came to me through Tech Waterloo. So everything is tied together in so many senses, but it's all done outside of school again until I came to iSTEM, of course, where I'm getting so much more opportunity to learn and apply all my thinking to everything I want to do, extracurriculars and what I want to do inside of school. So my yeah. next question then would be, would there have been benefit if you'd gotten exposure to some tech in elementary school? Uh, I'm sure there would have been if I had started it earlier. Uh, not only would it have made me better than what I am right now, but it also would have given me more opportunity to learn more in the ISTEM program and enhance further. Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you so much for coming today uh, and sharing your your passion. I have to remind myself you're in grade nine. Like I'm, I, the, the, what you're sharing with us, I'm expecting from a, like the higher level learning. It, it's it's really so so inspiring. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, certainly, this we're thrilled that this is uh, available in Aldershot. And I bet there were many families who would like to go uh, who are currently not living in Aldershot. And we heard from a, a student who, who um, travels in, which I'm glad to hear that. What would you say to those families who are maybe, you know, looking for something unique, inspiring, who are out there wondering whether they should make the, the trek into Aldershot to take this program? Um, I was really hesitant at first as going because I'm like, it's going to be very far. I won't know anybody there. But once I got there, like, I really do enjoy it because of the learning and, like, what I get to do and how much I like it better than, like, my previous school. So I would say, yeah, <laughs> you should make the journey. It's worth, it's worth taking the train even though I have to wake up early because I really do like the program. So, worth taking the train to Aldershot mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing. All right, mm -hmm. good. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, there's no one on the speakers list right now. So um, I, I, I follow the Twitter account I have since I think it started. And uh, I, I encourage all the trustees to get on there because it is wild seeing um, what, it, what they're doing. And it, it's a little, you know, just a little touch of a, you know, a video. I've seen some of the rocket stuff already. I saw the, you know, <laughs> whatever that thing is going around. <laughs> what was that thing going around anyway? Do you want me to it's, it's, it's just called a string test. So you, you swing the rocket around, and if it wobbles, it's not steady. So you need to rebuild it. Oh, I see. Oh, OK, that's cool. Uh, or the lasso I, test. I was pretending to be a, a cowboy that day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that uh, it, it, this is exposing students uh, beyond beyond the regular classroom, but also beyond our own facilities and our, our own, you know, what we've kind of seen as our, our uh, we've kind of put a mushroom over ourselves in the past and said, this is our spot, right? Um, where now we're reaching beyond, we're reaching to McMaster, we're looking out into uh, industry around us and, and they're willing to support us back. And that's wonderful to see. Uh, I can see how inspired the students are that are sitting in front of us, and I, it's all, it's so worth it. Um, and uh, I, I wish we could put this in other parts of the board. Um, I know that uh, though we have people trekking in on the train, uh, I can see people from the north not being able to do that as easily. Um, but. Uh, you know, perhaps it's something we can aspire to if we can somehow do it. Um, but, uh, oh, there's someone else on the list, so I will clamp down. And, because uh, <laughs> I'll just talk forever. Vice Chair, Vice Chair L. Harrison. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. To the three students that spoke tonight, I just want to say how uh, impactful what you had to say was about your journey during this really short period so far. Um, and for me, the rocket is metaphorical as well, you know, that yourselves and the program have lots of blasting off to do. And I just wondered, given that the um, November 12th open house is coming up, are 
there plans for students to be there and share just like you did tonight? Because I can imagine that, you know, last year yourselves and your parents or your families uh, were pioneers and you were really going into the unknown. But for this year coming up, we have you um, and this wonderful staff that are supporting your learning journey. Uh, so I hope that you can be there as well because you're all extremely well-spoken and we did have, a great job. We have about, I think, 30 students committed yeah. to come minimum. I think more want to be involved. We get more every day that say they want to be involved. They'll be in the, the two iSTEM rooms that were renovated. Um, we have a panel on the question and answer period, and we have a panel up on the stage with the presentation. So there's, there's lots of... Lots of students there. And it, in January, we're going to have a, a student exhibition of work um, where the, we can invite the public in, the board in, to come see what the students are doing as well. Trustee Oliver. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, thanks so much for your wonderful presentation. You guys are truly inspiring, and I can see that school is um, so much more for you. It's, it's actually an enjoyable um, mind-boggling and an exciting experience and, and you're really thriving so that's great to hear I'm um, this is a question more for the administrators uh, and maybe for superintendent Blackwell um, I understand that those who take the four-year program uh, receive an ISTEM certificate I'm curious if this is a, a program that students could could try out for a year as well so if they're enrolled at another high school could they come in in grade 10 or 11 um, and, and, and do that kind of a specialized um, one-year period? So the short answer with iSTEM is no. Um, it is a packaged uh, set of courses, and some of the learning builds off the previous year. Um, so right now we have marketed it and shared that it is a program that starts in grade 9. It doesn't mean that there are not some, some great learning opportunities offered at home schools where they're packaging courses together. Um, I do want to, to say, and I don't know if, if it was acknowledged, was, you know, we have this, this group, uh, or we have all these great things in terms of brochures and pamphlets, and we can put all these plans together, but the, the staff that is working on this program and in developing it has been, uh, they have worked extremely hard, and they are, uh, changing on the fly and working with the students and listening to the students. Um, when you talked about having a program in another part of the board, this is, they're really taking their time to build this strategically and, and as they're working on this year, they're building next year and making connections for next year. So we will have a great model um, at the end of four years and, and we need to make sure that we're, we're building it very purposefully and, and again, the staff that's involved is, is key in that. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and, and yes, our, we do have a, a number of schools offering schisms and, and different pathways, so, so that's wonderful. And those students can pursue their interests that way. And I sincerely hope that every student at HDSB is as excited about school as you guys are. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of our speakers list. Thank you so much thank for you. coming out. It was a fabulous presentation. I think I lost my slides. We're not done, Kevin. So very quickly, um, again, uh, it, you are welcome to attend next week, trustees, to the ISTEM Open House, but uh, one of the things that Mr. Mitchell mentioned was that if trustees are interested in seeing the program in action with students, uh, we'd be happy to arrange a, a time for you to go in and, and talk to the students and, and see what they're doing. So just quick updates, because I know our time is running quickly here. Uh, the quick updates, just for information, the integration committees have been formed for both Nelson Robert Bateman and Burlington Central Robert Bateman. We've had our first meeting at the board website. Uh, there are two sections which have the agendas and records of action, and we will continue to provide updates uh, around those committees. We've had our initial meetings, and we have some, some good ideas to move forward with. 
And if you're interested in looking at some of the details, uh, they are posted at this time. Uh, Nelson and Robert Bateman, as you know, they began working together last year, the leadership class and the community pathway program that's continuing this year. They've got some shared extracurriculars. I'm sure you can read all of the bullets and some of the things that are happening. I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom left and, and that's an art installation that's at the inside of uh, Nelson. Uh, it is something that was created by students and it, it spells Nelson and Bateman if you read every other letter. Uh, that is not uh, the way that the school is being um, memorialized at, at Robert Bate or at Nelson, but it is something that's been front and center for the students all year. So their slogan that they're working on is "Better Together" this year. And uh, as we've learned from the Bateman, or sorry, from the Pearson MM process, that's an opportunity to create better for all students, including students at Nelson. Uh, again, staff are working together. This began informally last year. They've met for February and uh, October PD days, and there's an upcoming PD day, PD day that they will be reconnecting on. Um, you'll notice that there are staff that have already moved from Robert Bateman to Nelson, which is great. Um, they're already working together uh, in the building. Some staff are working at both sites and traveling back and forth, but that's great for the students uh, that will be moving from Bateman to Nelson because they'll have the opportunity to see people that they recognize. Um, and uh, they're currently looking at developing course and program options for students, and those will be increased for all students in both schools, so that's exciting. Um, the Robert Bateman and Central, uh, I know Director Miller visited the uh, Accelerated Learning Program, some of the kids in, this, in the first year of the program at Burlington Central. They have work that's going on in terms of extracurricular opportunities. Uh, they have field trip opportunities on Friday. Uh, students from Robert Bateman will be traveling to Burlington Central for a full day. Uh, Lawrenceville is coming to Burlington Central. So that's exciting. And they're also looking at uh, ways to bring student leadership opportunities together. Uh, the IB program, as we know, is moving to Central for next year. Uh, currently, again, uh, the same situation is that we have staff from Robert Bateman that are working at Burlington Central this year and staff that is shared. Uh, the IB information session was last week, or October 24th. Uh, there were approximately 200 people there for the event. It was well attended. The application is different this year, and this is a board-wide option. Um, it is now available. Uh, the op application is done uh, at the board website, so the information is there. And um, the IB staff at Burlington Center, sorry, at uh, Robert Bateman have been instrumental in supporting that process, so they were also able to help with the evening. Just quickly, construction update. You'll see that M.M. Robinson, if you've driven by the school, the front of the building, that uh, six story, six class, six story, three, three story, six classroom addition uh, should be ready for second semester. And uh, the cafeteria and food school are coming along as well for second semester. You'll see that uh, the outside work landscaping will be coming in the summer. Uh, and then again on the right is a, a little picture of what it shall look like when it's done. Uh, Nelson, as you know, the last board meeting, uh, we had not received the funding. The Nelson community has heard uh, that the funding has been received by the ministry. September 9th, we got the funding. Uh, so that work is in progress. You'll see phase one of the outdoor learning space uh, at Nelson has begun. There are some modifications that will be happening to that space and some additions. We also have uh, some of the timelines around the Nelson construction and uh, the principal of Nelson will be sending home a letter to families on Friday just with just specifics around the updates. But you'll see that the manufacturing cafeteria and library will all be new additions ready for September. Uh, the community pathway program will be housed in the existing library. So that library will be relocated this year. They're doing a lot of shuffling within the building and we can appreciate uh, all the, the work that the school is doing to find alternate locations and spaces. And the CPP area will be ready for June of 2021 to support some of the transition pieces, as well as additional parking. And then there's some extra facility uh, construction that will be happening over the summer and into the fall, ready for semester two. So I'd be happy to take any questions. I 
I guess you've explained yourself quite well. There's no one on the speakers list. Thank you very much for bringing your update and your posse. That was wonderful. <laughs> There's lots of great things going on having to do with PAR. So next we are moving on to environmental sustainability. Superintendent Pachetti and Sam Burwell. Thank you very much. The Thank hot you seat through is yours. the chair. Um, so this is an annual presentation that Suzanne does to uh, bring you up to date with some of the environmental and sustainability initiatives that are undertaken at this board. Uh, I know that there is a more detailed report expected in February from us, uh, and we are also um, already scheduled to meet with our student trustees in the Senate. Uh, and so we'll be working away at that uh, report to come back in February. But in the meantime, we thought we'd continue with the annual presentation because uh, it's always great to share this uh, good news. And there's a lot of work that happens at our board on the environmental and sustainability front. So Suzanne's gonna take you through that. Okay, well, thank you very much. So this year I thought I'd do something a little bit different when we're looking at the sustainability initiatives in the Halton District School Board. So as we all know, over the past six months, all four municipalities and the region have declared climate emergencies. And they're pretty specific about the fact that they're expecting and hoping to work with the school boards in achieving some of the goals that they're looking at. We also have students who are raising their voices about the climate that they're, climate future that they're looking for by, um, through climate strikes and walking out. So using the sustainable development goals from the UN allows us to sort of provide a framework to evaluate where we are, where we need to go, what the global issues are, how those look locally. Quality education is number four, so it's one of the goals, but it also provides, is a key enabler to the, for the achievement of all sustainable development goals. Good health and well-being, quality education, climate action run through all of the sustainability initiatives that are going in all the departments and through all our schools in the board. When we talk about climate action and climate change, however, most people are talking about greenhouse gases, gas emissions these days. And in Halton, the people of Halton, they look at their transportation choices, where they live, how they heat and cool those buildings, and what their waste is. From a school board perspective, we can look at them from buildings and grounds, energy, water, food and drink, inclusion and participation, travel and traffic, purchasing and waste. In Halton, we are expecting that we will get, the weather will be hotter, wetter and wilder. So we need not only mitigation actions, but we also need to be looking at what our adaptation strategies are as well. So if we go along with the trans traffic and transportation, how our students and staff get to our schools and our places of work has an impact on air quality, traffic congestion. We look at our parking lots and it impacts our stormwater management. So the question sort of becomes, do we need to move beyond looking at running a, a walk to school campaign to looking at how our sites are designed? We build walk, walk to schools but we have kiss and rides and people are driving to our schools and dropping off their students. We need to look at our school design. How does that parking lot and the parking requirements impact how we're treating water, waste, um, storm water on site? Those are things that we can be looking at. Fortunately, we have good relationships with the municipalities in the region and our co-terminus board. Every meter counts is uh, part is sort of the name of the hub for active transportation in Halton. One of the things we also look at there, and uh, we don't think so much about it in Halton, but when you start looking around provincially, the fact that we have bike racks at every single school and facility services last year bought 200 additional bike racks for our schools is pretty unique. So we wanna, okay, we're missing the video. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't share the video with Kevin, so so we can't see it. We actually put together a small video about how facility services 
impacts the operations. I have to share it with you. I can share it at the end. Hope, we're hoping to put it actually up on my HDSB, so we'll all be able to look at it. No, it's a different one. We changed it a little bit. Um, so we'll cover all those things. Maybe I'll get it right at the end. Um, when we look at buildings, operation, maintenance, and construction, every time we build something in the school board, whether it's new construction, additions, renovations, we're looking at improving the lighting, the flooring, um, how we use energy. We look at improved doors, windows, roofs that improve the thermal envelope of our buildings, making them more energy efficient. When we look at the two pictures on the left there, that's actually sort of like picture taken in one direction and turn around and look at the other. The difference between the two hallways is that one has LED lighting, one doesn't. Um, one has an older style of tile that requires stripping and waxing every year. The other one doesn't, it's cleaned with water-based systems. Our LED lights provide better quality of light and they use less energy. When we look at the hand dryers, last year we used enough paper towel to cover 98% of the Trans-Canada Highway in paper towel. So looking at installing energy efficient and quieter, because I know that's always a concern, hand dryers impacts both the paper towel use and the energy use. When we get to the outside, we start looking at designing our spaces that include that um, expand the learning space outside. Not only do we look at enhancing the learning space, but also providing opportunities for physical activity and social and um, mental well-being. When we first started looking about 18 months ago about designing the spaces for the CPP program in the secondary schools, the first thing we learned was, boy, did we have a lot to learn. So unfortunately, there's no blueprint out there telling us exactly what to do. So we're, we're learning as we go. Facility services spent last year, the entire department within JWS attending an accessibility boot camp, which allows us to bring a universal design lens to what we're doing and making accessible better for everyone. Accessibility. So when we start taking those concepts and applying them to outdoor spaces, we start looking at how to create an inclusive space. So we start looking at the surfacing. We look at the fact that students, some students like to stand, some like to be the center of the action, some like to be on the side, some like to sit, some like to move. And when we started bringing these principles into the design, we had lots of great outcomes. One was that we ended up with accessible outdoor learning spaces that can be used by a whole classroom with a center point for instruction, or they can be used for small group learning. But then when we look at what, how the spaces were being used outside of instructional time, and we call it physical, maybe a physical activity break instead of a nutrition break because there's no eating outside. Um, but we look at one of these spaces and it becomes an opportunity for spontaneous study of nature. It also becomes a place where kids can be active up through, over, down, and around. And it also becomes a place where students can be engaging in small world imaginative play. And all that occurs within 30 seconds in the same space with no conflicts. Some of our schools are blessed with trees that are older than most of us. Most of us are parents, maybe even our parents' parents, but some are not. So one of the things that we start looking at is um, how are we gonna provide tree cover? There's a proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the next best time is today. So we're looking at succession planting, looking at how we're going to maintain tree cover, tree canopy on our sites. We're looking at diversity of species, making sure that we don't plant for the next emerald ash borer that comes through. We look at um, protecting those new trees once we plant them. And we always have to be aware as well that the impacts or the repercussions of climate change, which are that wetter, wilder weather, will have an impact on the tree health. So maintaining our trees is equally as important. And that's one of the things that facility services does. They have spent the last seven years with an emerald ash borer program to treat trees. Every year they inspect trees that impact our school properties. They remove dead wood, trim them, stabilize them, balance them. Whenever we talk about environmental programs in schools, 
recycling and garbage always comes up. We measure what goes out of our schools. We're required to, we meet our legislative requirements. If we recycled and diverted all the waste that we were supposed to, we would be able to achieve an 85 to 90% diversion rate in our schools. We don't, but we could. But the other thing that we have to start looking at is not just what are we throwing away, but what are we bringing into our schools? What is the impact of our procurement processes on what's coming in? Um, there's a question that looks at when you're looking at greenhouse gases and the impact of waste, but looking at how are we assigning the gases to the products? Are we assigning it to where they're produced or are they assigning that, those greenhouse gas emissions to where they're being used? Another part that we need to be considering is the Circular Economy Act. Things are changing. We don't know what it looks like yet, but I'm sure there's gonna be an impact on schools. When we start looking at opportunities for both the metrics to measure how we're doing and opportunities for change, I gotta say we use a lot of paper and we also print and copy it. And strangely enough, we have a recycling bin directly beside every photocopier. So there's lots of opportunities there. Perhaps we can use some technology to control how we use that paper as well. If you talk to students, single use plastic is huge. We now have straws only available upon request. They are available in our cafeterias. You just have to ask for them. Students are asking us what kind of materials are being used to serve the food. What kind of food is being served in our cafeterias? What's the impact of the waste that's being generated there? So one of the ways that helps students to sort of pull all this together is EcoSchools. EcoSchools is a certification program that allows students and promotes students to take action on occupant energy, waste diversion, biodiversity, school ground greening, active transportation, and student leadership. The thing is, we find those schools that do really well at this, they don't stop there. They get platinum certification and they go looking for other opportunities to affect change, other partnerships to develop, and other ways to interact with their communities. Which brings us to goal number 17, partnerships to, for the attainment of the goals. Facility services staff participate with um, our municipal partners on the development of climate action and community energy plans. We work with local organizations to promote action, opportunities for students to take action. And we work together to create common, common agendas to address common issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for, oh, there we go. Trustee Daniele. Thank you. And thank you for bringing this every year. Um, I know I've seen a change in how I approach things. I'm not there yet. There's a lot more I need to be doing, but you're helping me make my way incrementally into making a better world. And I appreciate that very, very much. Um, question probably through um, you, Madam Chair, to Superintendent uh, Jenny. Uh, I remember in my very first term, um, one of the trustees who was chair at the time, Jalinta Katarna, there was a very, very strong push when we were building schools to make them lead schools. And I'm wondering, is it, are we still doing that? Is that still of significance? Uh, through uh, Vice Chair L. Harrison to Trustee Daniele. Uh, no, we are not building lead schools. What we are building are um, leads like schools. We uh, have very high standards for the building envelope, uh, in part because the building code itself has um, upgraded its envelope thermal quality. Uh, we uh, use LED lighting in our schools. We use a very efficient mechanical system uh, in our schools. Every school board in Ontario that is building new schools is struggling to maintain that high standard of energy efficiency given the challenges we have with the capital benchmark. And I know I've spoken to, to all of you about that uh, before and we aren't really seeing any additional funding on the horizon for boards to build to a higher standard of energy efficiency, unfortunately. 
Director Miller. Through you, uh, uh, Chair Gravens to Trustee Danielli. There also is a significant cost to be certified as a lead school. Um, so, um, you know, we have to decide whether we can build it to the environmental standards that we want, and, or do we want to do it to the lead standards, which adds to the overall cost. And given our cost pressures, it's difficult to do that. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that you are doing as much as you are doing, um, given the diminished resources that we have to see that it is still a priority and there is still something being done. Thank you for that. Trustee Shuttleworth. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Suzanne. Um, I just have a quick, so you talked about recycling um, and I just, I, my, I don't know how this question fits into it, but um, I think about when we recycle, it goes into different boxes, right? So there's the green and there's the blue box. And I know from experience elsewhere that there is often a misunderstanding of what goes into what box. So what my question is, is are we in any way trying to help students to understand, because to put the thing, put it in the right box. Absolutely. As part of the legislation, we're required to have posters that are produced by the region. Part of the, con the confusion comes because there's so much diversity of what goes in which bin between municipalities. So a lot of times we'll have staff who live in one community and work in another, or parents who work in one community and live in our community, and there's that confusion about, I don't know, where does it go? that coffee cup, can I put it in compost? Does it go in a recycling bin? Um, lots of times, a, a, lot, a good way to engage the students is through eco-schools. Eco, a platinum eco-school produces roughly 50% less waste than a non-certified eco-schools. So that's one, one way to engage students. Um, another way that, and I sort of talked to you a little, about a little bit about it, was the Circular Economy Act. They're looking at standardizing it, so that it will become, it doesn't matter where you live, this particular item goes in this stream. So yes, we do work with students on a regular basis. We do do waste audits and that's part of the education program as well. If I can not follow up, but also again, I think it's not only students. Um, I think that it's also <laughs> grown-ups, even myself. So I was lucky enough to do a tour of the waste management facility in Halton. So I was told if it's like a pizza box that's had pizza and it goes in the green bin versus blue bin, but many people don't know that. So I think it's not only the students, but the staff as well. But thank you very much for all your efforts. Trustee Rocha. First, I'd like to thank Margot, Trustee Shuttleworth, for letting me know that my dirty pizza box has to go in the compost because I've been putting it in the wrong place. <laughs> Um, but that was not my question. Um, my question, so through you, Chair Grabenz, to either Superintendent um, Buccetti or Suzanne, um, we're living in an environment now where kids are really concerned about the environment. And you started off the presentation with um, a few words that said, instead of walking out, learn in. So what is it that we're doing to empower our students to start advocating for themselves, empowering them to make suggestions and implementing them. And I think some of the things I'm looking at is how do we get our kids to encourage their parents to let them walk to school? How do we encourage kids to bring less garbage into school uh, via friendlier, packed lunches, um, all these other things that they can do. So what are we doing to empower them and to get them to advocate for themselves? Okay, so it, it's interesting that you say, how do we get kids to get, change the parent behavior? Because we do understand that, that connection between what the perception of, for walking, what the perception of the neighborhood is and there's uh, a bit of a disconnect between I drive my kid because 
there's too much traffic and it's unsafe and the fact that I drive my kid and there's too much traffic and it's unsafe. So, so sort of building those communities and we've seen that in some of our, one of the schools that we just opened recently, um, there's, it's a walk to school and there's a thousand people walking down the street at the end of the day and it's, it's phenomenal, but that speaks to partly the, the structure of the school site as well, where we're looking at, do we say, hey, welcome, bring your car, or is it, um, it's difficult to bring your car, not impossible, but difficult. So sort of shifting that mindset around um, how, how we design our sites. So yes, we do have schools that run litterless lunches and all that information is provided. It's provided through lessons that are learned in the classroom. And I think um, we'll be talking about that in just a second. But again, it connects to providing students to take the opportunity and drive what's going on. There's been multiple times over the years where it's been a student who's brought things forward and said, you know, I really have a hard time with this action that's happening in our schools. I really don't want straws. How can we move and work together to get straws out of our cafeterias? And it works. And we all have to remember the blue box program, the success of it was driven through education systems in schools. Director Mill. Through your chair, advance to Trustee Rocha. That's an excellent question. And uh, Su um, um, uh, Suzanne Burwell has given a, a great answer from a structural perspective on the things that we're trying to do facility. But so much of that answer of your question is what our teachers and administrators are doing in schools around empowering kids to uh, uh, be self-confident, advocate for environmental issues, and, and, and to try to change behaviors within their schools, amongst their classmates, and in some cases, their teachers and administrators. But it all is led by, but I shouldn't say it all is led, but it's, it's working hand in hand with our teachers and our administrators. So I'm looking to Superintendent uh, Salmini to talk about elementary and and, and Superintendent Hunt Dibbins to maybe talk about what goes on in a secondary school and an elementary school which may empower kids to do these, these or undertake these. Okay. Certainly. Um, we do know that uh, student leadership is um, the greatest source in, in a school for leading these kinds of initiatives, and it's usually um, with the, the partnership of passionate teachers who also um, want to work towards these initiatives. So if we look at some practical examples, we know that kids do um, energy audits, they do education campaigns um, around um, things like litterous, litterless lunches, on walking to school, all of those pieces. Um, very practical, most elementary schools do have um, an environmental team um, of, of students that will lead this kind of work and it really is grassroots coming for the kids and trying to engage more and more of the student body uh, in these initiatives. Thank you through the chair to the group. Um, my nod was simply that I'm wondering if the student trustees wanted to share some things that they were familiar with. Um, I would just echo what Superintendent Salmini has said that um, education these days involves so much more student choice and student voice in what's happening and student voice is loud and clear in this generation in terms of their expectations for the future and their concerns for today. And we see that in class. Um, our iSTEM group that was just here uh, some of the problems that have come from the floor from the students that they're looking at, students reference ravine study ex um, and some other projects, um, climate change, the environment, it's all very much an issue for young people and um, they are reminding us older folks all the time in the classroom um, that we need to build in not only the educational piece but the action pieces and so whoever said it earlier, I think Suzanne about um, the young people teaching the old people about the appropriate behaviors. The same can be said for the classrooms today too and um, we hope that that continues. Can I just add in and for one second just uh, in, in elementary school we often think it's just our older students but if you walk into some of our kindergarten programs and look at the inquiry that's going on in there the ideas that are coming from some of our younger students is really promising too so I just wanted to add that it's not always our senior students in elementary school but uh, the very young uh, students are also getting very actively involved and, and uh, presenting inquiries. Trustee Burns. 
Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Superintendent Hunt Gibbons, for uh, bringing that up. Um, I'd like to say that I, have in the past year, have seen many instances where students have indeed taken the lead on environmental initiatives and indeed in other initiatives as well that they care about. Uh, specific examples include one student from Addy Park who last year started a petition that got attention in the municipality of Oakville that eventually led to a climate emergency declaration. Uh, there's also the 100 debates on the environment that were held in the uh, riding of North Burlington, which was entirely student organized, led and moderated as well between every single MP candidate for that riding. In the past year, I think, uh, as so far in my term as student trustee, I have seen incredible leadership from students all across Halton and in all different age categories looking to see what they can do to affect change, whether it be in uh, environmental issues or social issues or issues in their education. Students this year are doing the absolute best they can to make sure their voices are heard. And from the student trustees, I would like to say thank you to the entire HDSB for not only allowing that student voice to be heard, but for also encouraging students to be empowered and making their own decisions and for voicing their support for ideas they believe in. So thank you so much. Uh, Trustee Lau, did you want to? Oh, okay, excellent. <laughs> Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you, through the chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just wanted to build on uh, Trustee Rocha's comment, which was, you know, um, <clears throat> sorry, what what we're doing to reach out to students. Um, in in, a, in another way, what could our board of trustees do to assist this? What could we do? Um, how can we help? Um, I love hearing about the pizza box. I love hearing about uh, ideas in which I can uh, encourage my colleagues to, to make change. Um, what, what, what can we do? Through Chair Demands to uh, Trustee Reynolds and all trustees, I would remind trustees that the water bottle um, uh, AP was initiated at this table. Uh, I know we still have water bottles in schools and we have events where there's water bottles and, and we have vending machines with water bottles, but as, as you're fully aware, these things never happen overnight. And uh, it's unfortunate we didn't do a baseline study when before and after because we don't know how much we had. But anecdotally, I can tell you we have far fewer water bottles in this system than we used to. And that was initiated here. So I think you know, and I'll look to Superintendent Puchetti or Suzanne around. I think policies that bo that that the Board of Trustees passes, uh, holding staff to account for good environmental practices. You've already demonstrated it because uh, in February you're asking us to bring a report around some of our procurement uh, practices, some of our building practices. So I think trustees on the on the high level set a climate that allows staff, and more importantly than staff actually, our students to be able to pursue these environmental, uh, the, the, yeah, the water fountains where we, I forget what, what we now have water stations. As a, um, so I think your leadership is really, and your passion around the environment is what trustees can do, and be overt about it. Um, tweeting, whatever it is you, you, whatever vehicle you want to use to do that. And I'll, I'll look to Superintendent Puchetti if he's in shape. Thank you, uh, Director Miller. I would, I would agree with everything you say and also say that uh, uh, your role representing Halton District School Board out there in Halton at a time where all the municipalities in Halton are uh, you know, actively engaged in trying to define what the future is going to be in terms of our response to climate change and so on. I think that's very important. And I have received, uh, often you send me emails with great ideas because you're, you're hearing about other projects or other initiatives that are happening at schools and, and you, you flip me the email and it often it, you know, w most of the time it's it's things we've not heard or seen and then we, we go on and we look into it. So I would just continue to encourage you to to send us those ideas and anything you think that might work here. Yeah. Please. 
So I was wondering whether you wanted us to perhaps declare a carbon neutral school, um, a carbon neutral school board. Um, I, like I was thinking, let's let's uh, let's put a wish list out there. First one. So um, I would have to say that you, this would be my second school board that's declared itself a carbon neutral school board. And um, my former uh, school board did the same thing. I left before the big report was delivered about how to achieve that. Uh, it sounds great for new schools with the right funding. Uh, it is a very difficult thing to achieve for existing buildings. But I'd be uh, happy to um, go back to my former colleagues and ask them uh, for a copy of that report and share it with you because there may be some ideas in there that we can look at for sure. And I would add uh, through your chair, Drabens, Trustee Reynolds, I would look to the student trustees. Um, Associate Director Bogue and I met with the uh, student trustees this week as per a conversation at the previous board meeting. Um, at that happened at this table around environmental issues and I think uh, the leadership of the environment is going to uh, and those issues are going to come from our student trustees and their Senate. Um, I, um, Associate Director Bogue and I, our heads were spinning after speaking with these, these two, so. Okay, uh, there's no one else on the speaker's list. So um, I, I was happy to see on your presentation the every meter counts. Uh, I invest, when I saw that out on Twitter and I investigated and I, uh, kind of put it out there, you tweeted back that uh, you that we were involved already in that, and that's great. I would encourage the uh, trustees to go to everymetercounts.ca. There's a map there, and please share it with your communities. Um, it shows the walking distances to schools, and uh, it's really surprising how short the walk actually is. Um, so uh, for active transportation and uh, another little <clears throat> thing that's a little tool that I found useful is if you Google Halton put waste in its place they have a little tool that you can type anything in if you don't know is this recyclable or compostable or whatever in Halton it will tell you uh, where to put it and uh, sometimes why uh, so like we think compostable uh, utensils should go into the compost, but they actually aren't compostable in our region. They go into the garbage. Like, so that's useful information. So we don't contaminate our uh, composts with things that we think are compost. And then there's other things that are compostable that you didn't think were compostable. So uh, I would encourage that. I would love if teachers, you know, introduce that to their students as well. But um, I wanted to thank you very much for coming out. I know it's an annual report, but it's, it's wonderful to see uh, how we are doing, uh, what we are doing. Um, it's very important. Uh, and it's great to see the students also in a, a big leadership role in, in what we're doing, uh, it really, they lead us. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we are up to consent agenda items. Uh, so I'm going to just put the motion on the floor and then we can pull some things out here. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the consent agenda action items and receive the information items for November 6, 2019, moved by uh, Trustee Amos, seconded by Trustee Reynolds. Uh, now, is there any, uh, any discussion, any things that, I know there's a, there's a couple of things that I've, okay. I know I'd like to, to pull the annual drinking water report. And I've also understand that the supervision co-curricular, like the admin procedure update report 19124, specifically the supervision co-curriculars um, should be pulled as well. Uh, are there any other reports or minutes or anything that should be pulled? Trustee Shuttleworth, you want something? <laughs> no, okay. Oh, uh, Trustee Oliver, 
Yes, thank you. I wanted to have a, a quick question about the um, uh, procurement uh, AP. The, that's part of the uh, admin. Oh, that's separate? It's it, that's part of the admin procedure update? Yes. So procurement as part of that report. So that report has been pulled. So procurement in there and supervision of co-curriculars. Yeah, we're pulling the whole thing. Yeah. So just those are the things we're focusing on and then the drinking water one afterwards. Okay, so yeah. Trustee Oliver, why don't you start with yours? Okay, just a quick question around, um, I read this in great detail, and I'm just wondering if this is something that goes to the audit committee for a review of the process, specifically the approval processes and the methods of payment. Justine, I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> Superintendent Nagoya. Thank you, Madam Chair, Trustee Oliver. Uh, the procurement uh, uh, procedure is uh, um, something that we can provide to the audit committee as an information, of course. It is based on compliance. Uh, the broader public sector procurement directive has very um, uh, detailed uh, requirements in terms of what uh, a school board is required to uh, follow when procuring based on various uh, levels of uh, authority. And what we have done in this revised procedure is to align uh, the uh, approval uh, levels to the, uh, the next level of a different type of requirement in terms of procurement. Um, so we've aligned it to the next level of authority um, and uh, making sure that we stay aligned and also making it easier to follow for staff. Uh, there's only one a uh, particular authority for a particular level uh, for staff. Um, so I think that will make it a bit easier and cleaner to, to follow. And there's a lot of communication within our uh, staff uh, for that procedure and training. There's fall training uh, currently being um, um, conducted with the schools, the school staff and administrators, um, but also will be um, provided to all staff. Okay, and for the supervision co-curriculars, um, would you like to make a statement? Sure. Thank you, Chair Drabentz. I asked Chair Drabentz to pull this because I think there's a, a public interest in this report or in this admin procedure. Um, we have had in previous times some challenges during um, labor actions uh, in which um, one of the sanctions, a, a legitimate sanction, was not to participate in coach extracurricular activities. Uh, it was primarily in our secondary schools, but there's a little bit in our, a wee bit in our elementary schools as well. Um, so we, if you'll recall, we had asked trustees a few weeks ago or a few board meetings ago to rescind the previous one because it was out of date. And uh, we've rewritten it following the guidelines through OFIA on high risk and medium risk sports and so on. So that's why that's here, because uh, I was approached in the summer by someone from a lo local sports organization wanting to know how they would be able to coach uh, our football teams if, if there had been an issue in terms of uh, teachers coaching it. And uh, so I think it's important for trustees to understand the rules of this. That's what this AP is about. But also there's a public interest in the community. So I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Hunt Divins. Um, to elaborate or, or highlight the significant parts of it. Thank you, Director Miller. So, on the very first page, the cross-reference um, is a rather daunting list of things that supervisors, coaches, and people working with our young people in a extracurricular capacity have to be aware of, and it ranges anywhere from concussion management to um, epilepsy seizures, head protection, first aid, localized standards. It, it's a very daunting list. And it is that list of cross-reference and the requirements for supervision that then create these categories of lower, medium, and higher risk activities. And since 
um, this was last updated, we've also had some very significant changes to who can coach and who can coach particular activities. So we now have definitions of what are called higher risk activities. In um, 2016, we had a requirement to create a protocol for training for our higher risk sports. Um, identify these and then provide for all of our coaches the training. It also meant that those teams could not operate if they did not have the trained personnel on them. And um, football, uh, I'll use as an example since Director Miller mentioned it. So football as a high risk sport whose training occurs every spring, we provide the training and on that coaching team there must be a minimum of one certified coach uh, who has gone through uh, the Ontario football training. The word, uh, the definitions in this exist to try and help clarify the wide use of vocabulary. We can't assume that the one who coaches is also the one who supervises. Um, we have community coaches, we have coach liaisons, we have supervisors and um, a, an example would be you have a team where the staff supervisor does not know anything about the sport. Is there booking the buses, taking attendance and being a helper? Because without that person's uh, presence, the team could not continue. And there's an outside coach, a volunteer, who's actually doing the coaching and the person that the kids would call coach. And it is because of all these definitions and, and the focus on student safety, as you can see in the cross-reference, where things have changed over the last number of years. And so drawing your attention to the area on extraordinary circumstances, because I think that's where public interest would lie in this. There are some pieces in here that outline the levels of risk from lower, medium, and higher risk based on the activity components, the type, the duration, and the proximity. And those are what would then define whether or not the activity could continue without the presence of someone who had the other training pieces that were required. There are also processes that follow this administrative procedure that are outlined on the last page of the AP that if we did find ourselves in extraordinary times that we would be going through an exercise where we categorized our co-curriculars so that we were all clear as to what was lower, medium and higher risk in any particular school site and that we would ensure that our community was also aware of uh, what was running and how it was categorized. Um, so if there are any questions, I will do my best to answer. I see no, oh, one snuck on. Trustee Gray. Thank you to the chair, uh, um, to Superintendent Hunt Gibbons. Um, back in the day, playing sports was a simple, fun, easy to get together and play. When I look at the front page of this admin procedure and all the cross references, it becomes very clear that it's a very complex thing anymore and with all kinds of different references to different procedures that anyone who would be involved with co-curricular activities would have to know um, about. And so I guess I would, I would ask the question of Superintendent Hyde Gibbons, um, how are our staff made aware of all of these and to what level are they trained in all of these so that they can perform their duties um, in a safe way with our students? Thank you. Through the chair to Trustee Gray. You're quite right. There's been uh, quite a change since the day when we were all playing sports. Um, e even in my teaching career, I remember that if you played a varsity sport as an athlete, that was enough to say you knew it well enough to be a coach in that area. That is no longer the case. One cannot coach simply because one played at a varsity level. Um, it's only, you can only coach in our higher risk areas if you have been certified in coaching within the last three years. And I think the qualifications and the requirements of coaches are all a result of all of that long list of cross references with a focus on safety. And to ensure that our coaching staff has these, um, we use our athletic directors and um, uh, 
couple very special people in the program department who are very much experts in this area. And we ensure and monitor our coaching staff. We ensure that all of our teams have the appropriate staff in place or they're not able to uh, participate through HSSAA, our athletic association. We offer the opportunities in a timely fashion well before the season, i.e. for the fall season, since I referenced football earlier. Uh, that training session was in the spring in order that we knew going in who was certified and to ensure that every team had a certified person with on, within it. And then, of course, students have to meet certain requirements too, and that's number of uh, contact practices, et cetera, before they could take a field, and then similar requirements in various different activities. So our athletic directors within all of our schools are responsible for the management of the co-curricular program. Uh, they communicate out the training opportunities where we have expertise because we have some very high qualified people on our own staff, who are national team athletes, et cetera, and coaches, we use them. Where we don't have, we hire and bring in the experts at a cost to ensure that we are uh, complying with certification recommendations. We also provide first aid training on a regular basis and we chart and record all of that. Our first aid training is very much focused on uh, spinal and concussion issues as well as the use of AEDs. Um, it's a 16 hour course. Uh, part of it is online, part of it is in a classroom. And again, we track and monitor who has taken that course and what, um, which of these different other APs they have been exposed to and trained on, as well as just general staff. So at the beginning of a school year, for instance, all staff has a review on things like Sabrina's Law and Rowan's Law. And thus, as much as we appreciate and, and very much value our volunteers in schools, we need to have those people on site who are actually familiar with and have had the EpiPen training and um, concussion management protocol training and those types of things. Uh, Director Miller. I, I would just add for trustees, if we find ourselves in a, uh, a situation going forward in the next uh, few weeks or months in which um, uh, their, uh, um, teachers are not coaching their sports um, or conducting their extracurriculars, this uh, previous experience tells us this is a, a hot topic for the community and a big issue for the community and we are often getting very well-meaning parents and very well-meaning community members uh, contacting us, contacting trustees about um, coaching, coaching teams. We would provide the trustees with um, some speaking notes and those kinds of things, uh, but uh, you know, we would obviously be in total compliance with our administrative procedure um, around this. And an example is a higher risk sport. There is no way we can conduct a higher risk sport without one of our staff members um, because that's that's our liability and insurance and, and all those other things. So, okay, thanks. Okay, I think that's all the questions for that particular report. Now the other one is the annual drinking water report. Um, Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a quite a, um, an easy question, <laughs> and that is, could you please uh, remind us what the acronyms are in the report? Um, they are a bit confusing. I thought I figured out some of them, but I think I might be wrong. Thank you, uh, Chair Grabenz, and my apologies. When we saved this into a PDF, we chopped off the last little part of the chart that's in Appendix A, and that's the piece that contains the definition for the abbreviations. So uh, we did fix that and post it on the, uh, on the website, so it's corrected now, but I'll just tell you what they are. So S equals sync, D, uh, DF equals drinking fountain, BDF is uh, bottle filling station. So yeah, it, it, the acronym doesn't quite fit, uh, but it's a bottle filling station. Uh, most of our bottle filling stations also have a fountain component, so they're actually two fixtures in one. Uh, WC is water cooler. That would be one that's uh, 
hard, hard connected to the water supply of the building. Uh, RS is resample and ND is not detected. Okay, and it's been updated online. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's that's actually very helpful. I see there's a bunch of people on the list, so okay. I will uh, let them have their questions, and then if mine okay. isn't covered, I'll come back on the list. Uh, Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, I was asked uh, to ask this question from a group of parents uh, with children in the Tom Thompson uh, School community. Uh, they remain concerned that Flushing our systems are a band-aid solution that wastes potable water. The report speaks to some ways that lead gets into drinking water and how that, um, uh, how we've done things to mitigate that by changing uh, fixtures. Um, but they want to know whether, do we know for certain the root cause? Uh, and what can we do to mitigate this issue for the long term? Their concern is as well that um, some of these residents live between two school communities that uh, are on the exceedance list between Central and Tom Thompson. And they are concerned that uh, they want to know whether their drinking water at home is okay because they feel that uh, if we aren't absolutely certain that perhaps it could be a municipal concern. So I think why I'm bringing this up today is because they really want to know where they can go for answers um, and they want to be absolutely certain that we are doing uh, what we can to mitigate this issue. Thank you. Through the chair to Trustee Reynolds, um, I think those are all uh, very important questions and uh, I can understand uh, everyone's concern. Uh, I think those mirror the concerns that, that we've been hearing. So um, I think it's important to understand a few uh, aspects of the water testing. We test the water fixtures. Um, it's water fixtures that are designated for consumption for drinking water or food preparation. Um, so that's one important thing. The other important thing is the majority of our schools do not have lead pipes. People think that that is not the case. Um, we have uh, in older buildings probably copper and where we may have some lead is in the soldiering, which is the joints. And in some cases, there may be lead in some of the brass that is the, that uh, are, make up the fixtures in, in the schools. Um, so the, the, since 2017 and the change in the regulation, which, which uh, the Ministry of the Environment um, brought about, our emphasis is on testing the fixtures. Um, in a school. And then the flushing protocol is also the emphasis is on the fixtures that are designated for drinking water or food preparation. Um, so yes, I appreciate that people wonder whether with the quality of the water and I'm no expert. I, I can't speak to the municipal quality of the water. I can only speak to what we do in our schools and we meet the regulation and uh, as you see in the report, where we have standing samples that exceed the current threshold of 10 micrograms per liter, in the majority of cases, the flushed sample is below the threshold. And we do our flushing every day and our custodians maintain a logbook. Most custodians have a whole routine about how they do this. And we in service and train them. In fact, we have a, another training session coming up uh, on November 22nd for our custodians. And we train our field supervisors and we've been updating our um, fixture of, uh, information on our floor plan. So this is something that we keep on top of. Trustee Oliver. Uh, through you, Chair. Thank you, Superintendent Pachetti, for your report and, and the detail um, that you've provided. 
And certainly your answers to uh, Trustee Reynolds' questions have provided more clarity for me. Um, I've looked at all of this, but I'm going to focus my questions on the schools in my ward, Ward 4 Oakville. Um, and specifically, when I looked at all of them, a um, couple of uh, fixtures and lab results um, for Heritage Glen uh, raised a, a flag for me. So I understand the difference between testing standing water and flushed um, water. I'm, and I think I know what a fixture is, but to clarify, could you provide a definition of fixture? Certainly through the chair to Trustee Oliver. So a fixture would be a sink, tap, um, a drinking fountain, or the uh, water bottle filling fountain. Um, I think in some cases we do have water coolers that are connected back into the building's water system, not the, the, the portable ones. Um, so those are, those are fixtures that we test, sinks and drinking fountains and water bottle filling stations. Okay. Um, so um, what piqued my interest is uh, at Heritage Glen, there are two um, sink um, taps, I guess, fixtures that ranked quite high in the um, micrograms per liter in the standing water. Certainly that changed with the flushing. But when I compare, um, compare this data to Pilgrim Wood, which is roughly same vintage of school, uh, those re there were no such readings. And I'm not sure if it's just because of the, um, the time frame or, or if this is a complete list of uh, fixtures tested in this time frame, but that kind of raised my um, uh, interest in why that would be, because I would expect similar results and similar outcomes after flushing. And I'm also wondering if, uh, um, if this data for per fixture is tracked historically and compared historically. So is there a noticeable trend that things are getting worse? And at which point do you decide a replacement has to be made? Thank you through the chair to Trustee Oliver. So uh, as we note in the body of the report, 2019 is the last uh, year of the three-year testing for elementary schools, and it is the beginning of the three-year testing for secondary schools. So you would be able to go back, and it's posted on our website. Parents can, can go back and have a look, and you can see what the previous year's reports are for each individual school. Uh, I will say that uh, Heritage Glen, and I did put my glasses on, so I think I read this correctly, did not have any samples above the threshold in standing. I don't believe it did. I'll just double. It did? Okay, so sorry. Sometimes It, it came close. In, in the standing water, it was 8.7 and 9.5, right. the two fixtures. Right. So it, it, that is still below the 10 micrograms per liter threshold for the ministry. Um, and the difference between two schools that are relatively the same age, it, it's, it's very much because of the, the sort of chemical reaction to the water, to the fixture types, to um, uh, just the frequency of use in the school. Uh, they're not actually that dissimilar. P Pilgrim Wood had a lot of uh, not detected results this year. So both of those schools are, uh, have very good readings. They, they didn't have any lead exceedances, it would appear. Um, I'd have to go back and have a look at what happened in 2018, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I agree. Uh, there were no exceedances. Um, I was just concerned that the standing um, levels were approaching that 10, per, uh, 10 micrograms per liter threshold, but certainly corrected with the flushing, so that's good news. Um, and, um, and also in thinking about the historical trends, I'm wondering if you're using this data to predict what are the best types of fixtures. Thank you, uh, Trustee Oliver. That's a great question to ask, and we do monitor the data, and in fact, we do go in and um, uh, replace fixtures and retest the fixtures and, and in some cases we'll even uh, run new plumbing, cold 
supply lines to the fixtures to ensure that we're below the threshold. We do that uh, as part of our regular renewal work in, in schools. And we focus on uh, those fixtures that are um, key drinking fountain fixtures, uh, sinks that are in serveries or um, hospitality programs. But what we are finding is that there are a lot of sinks in rooms like libraries, science rooms, auto shops, that if they hadn't been properly identified in the floor plans, and that's why we've been working so hard to update our information, they were tested and they shouldn't be designated for drinking water. Uh, and so that's why we're going around all our schools and updating the, po the sign post to say, uh, these are not for drinking water. Trustee Amos. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Fuchetti, this is very timely as there was recently an article in the Toronto Star and one of um, my schools, White Oaks, was mentioned. Um, but what wasn't mentioned was the fact that one of the highest exceedances of lead in those schools was during a summer period when there was construction happening and there was no water flowing through those pipes and then it was still tested and found exceedingly high. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, the system was flushed after that and then was found to be okay, is that correct? Yes, uh, Trustee Amos, that is correct. Um, and we take, the the, we take the water samples, we are required to do it between May and October. Um, in our experience, we found that it's best to do it during the summer because then the c contractor can get in there without causing too much disruption to the school. Um, but the risk of that is that you have water that is not used frequently. And in the case of 2018, at, at that school in particular, we had construction happening. So there was very little activity happening in the building. So we got very high standing water results, but the flushed uh, results indicate that we were within the threshold or below the threshold. Can I follow up? Well, thank you for that information. And I just wanted to clarify it so that um, the community was aware of that. The other piece of it is that we do have protocols to share with the principal um, and let the parents know through um, information. But there was a question about students not knowing. Is that something that we should be looking at as part of our protocol to make sure parents are aware or students are aware because I know that um, we are labeling now that where it's not drinking water, it's only hand washing water, but I think we need to make sure that we are educating students that that is the reason why. So I'm just curious as to what is happening down that route. Um, thank you, Trustee Amos, and, and I think that is something that we're actually going to discuss as a senior team. Um, you know, we want to uh, always look every year to see what we can do to improve our protocol and particularly uh, our, our communication protocol. I know that last year there were some of the secondary schools that did share the information with students. In fact, I was interviewed by a group of students at one high school who had decided to, to make uh, do an article on, on uh, drinking water. Um, so it's something we can certainly bring forward. All our information is posted online and our webpage online, thanks to the, the great work done by the communi communication team, we have FAQs there, we have links to other um, uh, organizations like the Ministry of the Environment. We provide a lot of very useful information there, but that's something we can certainly take away and look at. Thank you for sharing that great information. Trustee Shuttleworth. Okay, my question is quick. Um, I just have a question as to the ordering of the results. So when I look at the results, they're not in chronological order. Is and it, it made it a little bit confused. I'm just wondering why. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Shuttleworth. I think it's because we're actually ordering them by the number of the fixture, um, not so much by the chronology of when they're tested. And don't forget, uh, as I said, for high schools, this is the first year of year one. This is year one of three years. So what you're seeing here represents one third of the fixtures in the schools. There will be another group done next year and another group done the year after that. 
Um, but no matter what, if there is a lead exceedance, uh, you begin the flushing protocol at the school, uh, regardless what year you're in. Trustee Rocha. Um, through the chair to you, Superintendent Puccetti, I've got two, um, I guess, more points of clarification and then one question. You mentioned that elementary schools, this is the third year and last year of testing. We'll, we will keep testing, but we've met the ministry requirements of testing all the fixtures uh, in the elementary panel. Um, every board had to do that within three years. Um, and so we've met that, but we will begin again next year and do more testing. Okay, great. And then my next point of clarification, and maybe you've mentioned this and I've just missed it. You mentioned um, staff flush the water. How long do they flush for? Not on that day, but for, is it two days, two weeks, two months? When do they stop flushing water? Thank you. So there is a difference between uh, some schools are designated for daily flushing. So that happens every morning uh, at the school. And other schools are at weekly flushing. Uh, and the daily flushing are ones that have had a lead exceedance. And the daily flushing are ones that have not. And they do this for, um, right now it's a two year period. Um, the Ministry of the Environment may change that, uh, but at this point, there it's two years worth of flushing that we have to do. That's a lot of water. Um, and my, my third one is actually a question. So for the most part, the lab results show a number, um, the lab results for standing show a number, and then the flushed results typically are lower. What would cause the flushed results to increase? I don't know what would cause the flush results to increase. Most of the time, the flush results are lower. But if the flush results were higher, um, there may be an anomaly, and we do have anomalies. They do have to go back and do a retest. Um, and also, if it were over the threshold, that would definitely uh, require uh, a retest. Um, so I'm not sure how many instances we have. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'd have to okay. ask someone technical. Okay. So it could be yeah, one of those technical people. Yeah, so um, I don't know if there's a, so this, this impacts one of uh, my schools and it's one of the schools where I've been getting a lot of concerns from parents. Um, and it is a situation where it went from 7.9 <clears throat> standing and it doubled to 14 flushed. So maybe it's a typo, maybe it's 1.4, not sure. Uh, but the report is showing 14, which is exceeds the 10. Um, this is Falgerwood Public School on page 10 of 35. I'll certainly have a look okay. at that and get back to you. Thank That's you. very strange. Yep. Okay. So as everybody dives into their reports, uh, Trustee Lau. <laughs> Uh, through you, Chair, to Superintendent Puccetti. Um, so I just wanted to voice my support for um, informing students directly because as um, Trustee Amos said, uh, the Toronto Star has been, has um, released an article and many students have been misinformed about um, the school I go to, White Oak Secondary School, and many are not drinking any of the water there because they're concerned that all of the fixtures are um, exceeding the lead. Um, so my one of my questions was was not pertaining to what Trustee Amos brought up about the extremely high one in the summer, but the two that um, failed the test for the flush samples in North Campus. Um, 
my mom sent the email to me um, just to inform me. And I'm just reading from it straight. There were two flushed exceedances, and then those were replaced with new bottle filling stations and then retested again. And then the test results failed again. And then um, they replaced the water supply lines and the fixtures are now being retested again. Um, and it also says that the HDSB Facility Services Department is awaiting results on this test. I was just wondering, um, on page 80, are those the, the new updated, um, the new updated uh, stats, or are we still awaiting another test? Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look into that. But I will tell you that in the North Campus, there were two sinks tested that probably shouldn't have been tested, one being in a science room and the other one being in a tech design. Is that how you call it? Tech design room. Those should not have been tested. And it all goes to why we want, we keep working on our floor plans to make sure the information is very clear. Uh, a school like mm -hmm. Oh, well, I know M.M. Robinson, for example, has 99 fixtures, um, and not all of those fixtures are for drinking water. So we need to be very clear that we signpost and that we don't unnecessarily test fixtures that are not designated for drinking water. Uh, through you, Chair, to Superintendent Pichetti. Um, so yes, those were the two, the science and the tech room. But these two, um, even on the report, was labeled BDF. So that would be the bottled drinking, drinking fountains. fountains. Yeah. yeah, so um, those are separate from what um, Trustee Amos also was talking about. But could you um, get back to me on that? Because Absolutely. I have a lot of students and a lot of my teachers today, at every single one of my classes, they all brought it up. And then they kind of looked to me. And then I said, I would, I would ask you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Director Miller? Through you, Chair Devance, actually, I have a, trust, a question for Trustee Lau. You said that many students at White Oaks are concerned and don't want to drink the water. Um, I, I'm looking at Superintendent Etoff. I, uh, maybe we can help the principal with some communication around uh, addressing their concerns and Manager Denton's over there as well. If we can get some, um, we'll be in contact with the principal tomorrow to see what we can do. We don't want. We don't want the students being fearful. I mean, we want them to drink healthy water, but the vast majority of the water in there is, you know, it, it, White Oaks has passed all the tests, so maybe we need to get some communication to the principal about that. So, uh, um. so uh, uh, through the chair, uh, just as an update, uh, yesterday we did send out um, uh, a communication to all of our uh, administrators. Uh, from, from the communications team, um, along with a template letter that could be used uh, not only with staff, but, uh, but with, our, with our communities as well, under the direction of uh, that there's already a lot of information out there. And so um, if there are concerns coming forward, that this could be a tool that could be used in addressing those concerns on an individual basis and or uh, be used in a more blanket way in terms of putting out to the broader, uh, to the broader community. As of about four o'clock today, um, uh, we were in touch with, with White Oaks and uh, in terms of coming in from the public to the office area or to the school board here, there, there weren't any complaints or any, now that doesn't mean that they aren't going to the school trustee or that they aren't, that staff aren't, aren't concerned, but um, in terms of tracking the data and our social media and, uh, and what's actually coming into the school office, um, there, there were, zero uh, emails and, and zero complaints. But uh, having said that, we'll go back um, with the superintendent for the school um, and, uh, and certainly uh, address how we can uh, facilitate um, greater communication with those who require it. We'll ask uh, Superintendent Ruddock to connect with the principal tomorrow. And Trustee Lau, you had something else? Um, through you, Chair, to, uh, to Director Miller. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention that many students don't directly email like um, like the principals or their teachers if they have a concern, but instead they turn to social media and they end up posting on their stories, so their private stories that some people don't see and then it gets shared and shared. So 
It's not really, it's not usually brought up to administrators that they are concerned, but there has been a significant decline in, in students who are comfortable drinking our water at all. So I think that's, it's, it's very, very important that students are informed um, as well as when the parents are informed. So then students are well educated because simply knowledge is power. Thank you. Um, sorry, just that's a, a, an excellent piece that, that we will bring back. Thank you for that. Um, you just kind of uh, acute, acute us in that uh, uh, we are on uh, Instagram and so on and so forth. So we're going to work with uh, one of our specialists in the communication department tomorrow. Uh, I think around a targeted piece um, that uh, would, would specifically uh, get into the hands of our students in the ways that they're used to getting that information. So thank you for that suggestion. Thank you, uh, Trustee Lau. I mean, that's, you made a significant point. I mean, we, we, we don't want the kids feeling, well, the, the kids, the students feeling uncomfortable. And uh, it's, it's important that, well, you brought something to, to us that uh, I think is a, a learning lesson for all of us around the table tonight. So I very much appreciate that. Okay, on to Trustee Gray. Thank you through the chair to Superintendent Pichetti. Um, thank you for this report. I note in this report that last year there were 36 schools that were on the list. This year we have 33. I look at the numbers of fixtures that were tested. We're almost testing three times as many fixtures and three times as many samples taken this year. So lots of work happening. But I have to say that of the 33 schools that are on the list this year, 16 of those were on the list last year. And so my question is, um, uh, do we track and plan remediation for those schools that are repeatedly on the list? Through the chair, thank you, Trustee Gray. Um, and a similar answer I think I provided to uh, Trustee Oliver. Yes, we do track. And as I said, we prioritize replacement of fixtures that are um, important drinking fountain fixtures or in uh, food preparation areas. So we will go in there and replace those. Um, we also uh, verify to see whether the fixture is in fact necessary for drinking water. As I said, if it's in a science room or the back of the library it, it, and it's been mislabeled, then we, we have to go through a process to take it off the list to, to make sure it's only a hand washing only fixture. Uh, but we do monitor the list and we do a fair amount of fixture replacement every year. Okay, Trustee Amos. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit on what Trustee Lau was speaking to. So the two areas of concern that she was talking about was um, on White Oaks North Campus, and they were both the bottle filling stations. So I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that if they were in exceedance even under the flush, that they would be offline and not be able to access to students at that point, and that there would be alternatives provided. Correct. Typically, we would bag the filter, uh, cover it up, make it or turn the water sauce source off to the fixture until we had received the water source. To, uh, yeah, we turn off the fixture until we had received the all clear. Uh, and I know at White Oaks, we did replace quite a few water fountains and two of them, we had to then go back in and replace the supply line because even with the new fixtures, they, they were above the exceedance. So I'm assuming that I, I always like to double check with my staff, and I will, that if those fixtures are operational now, we have had them retested and they met uh, the, the requirements. Otherwise, they would continue to be bagged. You wouldn't be able to use them. Um, Follow-up? Thank you for that information. And the other piece, um, as a follow-up, again, to Trustee Lau's concerns, um, while I appreciate the communication that just went out to all the, um, uh, the principals and administrators, um, I do believe that the concern was um, that the students wouldn't get that information, even as shared with parents, potentially. And my Instagram, it may be a good route. I think there needs to be other avenues maybe to reach out through, somehow through the school to those students, and I'm not sure what that is. 
Um, maybe our student trustees could tell us better, but I do feel that um, it is very important, especially if the students, and very rarely do students contact me. I do have them occasionally, but they don't reach out that far, and they need to um, be aware that what the water on the campuses is okay to drink. I would agree 100% with those comments, um, Trustee Amos, and and uh, the Superintendent Ruddock will speak with the principal tomorrow, and we'll try to get to uh, this because it, it's a little disconcerting to hear that 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 students are worried about drinking the water, and uh, I, I honestly can say I did not know that, and I appreciate the fact that why I don't know that because I don't know how to spell Instagram, let alone, um, but um, only kidding. But uh, I really appreciate that, uh, Trustee Lau and Trustee Amos. Trustee Lau? Yeah, just to follow up through you, Chair, to Trustee Amos. Um, Amos, sorry. Um, there are ways to get in contact with all of the students very efficiently. Um, for my school, at least, our student council is very on top of things. So they have a Google Classroom for every single grade with every single grade 9, grade 10, grade 11 student. So um, announcements that are posted there are always seen. So if we somehow post like an official HDSB letter that could be drafted, that could quickly go out to students. And I think that would definitely mitigate all of this confusion that's happening. Thank you. That's great to hear. That sounds awesome. Okay, uh, seeing no one else on the speakers list, it's my turn. Okay, so I have, now it's three questions. One is um, about uh, some of the, okay, right now, I, as, a, as a parent of a grade eight student, uh, I am very, um, I look very much to sort of that next step where my children could possibly go. And I know I'm not the only person who, uh, you know, does that. Um, my, you know, my choices would be, of course, between two of our schools. Uh, but uh, sometimes people are also looking uh, outside of our system. And I was wondering if we're communicating at all with the families, at least at the grade eight level, um, if there are feeder schools that they're probably like one of my schools is M.M. Robinson, it's on the list. Um, there are families making choices right now and they might be a little scared of seeing that M.M. is sitting on that list, even though the water is safe. My other daughter goes there, it's, she can drink all the water she wants because I know it's safe. So, um, uh, so are we, are we at all communicating with, or, or do we have a strategy? Is there, do we want to talk to feeder school students in grade eight or families? Um, is it something that admin council should take away and think about? Um, that's my first question. Through your chair events, I think it is something that we will uh, take away look at Superintendent Etoff and uh, Manager Denton that we, we need to take away and, and um, uh, we hadn't thought about the feeder school aspect of people making decisions and so on but it's certainly something that we need to consider so we will. Okay next question. Um, <clears throat> I uh, For fun I watch question period um, and uh, <laughs> there were many questions today. Uh, to both the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, I think, and the Minister of Education with regards to the water. And they kept referring to uh, lots of funds that are available. And I was wondering, uh, do we have access to these funds? Are they beyond what we've already received? Uh, through you, Chair Gerbens, um the funds that we have available are the school renewal funds and as you know earlier in private uh, I did mention uh, what our deferred maintenance backlog is um, close to 103 million dollars no wait 1163 it's been a long night yeah 163 million dollars uh, for high and urgent and medium priority work and we get on average I think about 28 million dollars a year 
uh, but that has to go towards all sorts of things. So that's uh, between school renewal and school condition improvement grant, that's the only funding that we have currently available to us to do um, upgrades to buildings, including um, replacing all the fixtures in a school or renovations of that kind. So it, there's been no additional money identified at this point. That's what I was wondering, because it kind of sounded like it might be, but I wanted to confirm that with you. Um, and then uh, finally, um, <clears throat> so I guess in March, uh, there, um, then there is national, there's now a national lead guideline that is uh, at five. Um, parts per billion, and um, we currently follow the 10 parts per billion, that's the Ontario guideline. What is the plan moving forward? Uh, thank you, and that's something we've been uh, thinking about quite a bit. In fact, all school boards in Ontario are, are looking at their um, previous year's test results, lead exceedances, to see where we fall within, you know, what, what that will yield right now. Um, we did a little quick calculation, but again, we don't have all the information yet, but I can tell you from a very high level, um, we have about 185 fixtures that had flush results over five uh, micrograms per liter. Um, and that represents about 4.6% uh, of the samples that were taken. But of those, we have removed or changed the designation of a significant amount of those. Um, because as I said, we're still, we're still finding discrepancies and we're still testing things that shouldn't be designated for drinking water. So between five and 10, at this point, we only see 35 fixtures, which seems a manageable amount to go in and address. Um, I think we're all going to have to look at what plans we put in place, um, and it is probably going to change at some point, but right now we meet the ministry requirement, um, and if they change it, we'll have to come up with a plan to meet that requirement of five micrograms per liter. Okay, uh, Trustee Amos, this has got to be your final question. It is my final <laughs> okay. question. It's more of a statement. I just wanted to note that one of the things that was mentioned in the article was Ontario is one of the few provinces that actually requires school boards to test water for lead. And I'm very thankful for the fact that we have such great staff who's doing this testing and that we are taking those precautions to make sure that students are safe. So I'd like to thank you um, and through you, your staff, for doing that and for making sure that our students are safe and that as they're most vulnerable at, um, at their early ages and more liable to be susceptible to something if there was uh, um, lead in the water. So thank you very much for doing that. Okay, there are no more speakers on the speakers list. Uh, thank you very much for all the work that you do. Uh, I know this has been a very interesting week and, uh, <laughs> and uh, please keep up the really great work that you're doing. Thank you very much. much okay, so that was, <clears throat> we were working on the consent agenda there. So um, uh, uh, We've moved it, we've discussed it. Now I'd like to call the question on uh, accepting the consent agenda, if I can find it. There it is. All those in favor of accepting um, and approving the consent agenda, act in, activate action items uh, and receive the information items for November. 6, 2019, and, oh, that's just me. <laughs> okay, that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, now 
We are up to ratification action items. Uh, Vice Chair Harrison, do we have any business from private session that requires approval? No. No. In fact, we do not. Okay, that's excellent news. We will move forward. Uh, for action, November 6, 2019. We have two action items for this evening. I'd like to draw your attention to the recommendation for the trustee honoraria, December 1, 2019, report 19121 on page 82 of your board package submitted by Superintendent Nagoy. May I have a mover? Uh, trustee Amos, seconder, Trustee Garretts. Thank you very much. I will read the recommendation. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the trustee honoraria effective December 1st, 2019, as noted in report 19121 in Appendix A. Is there any debate? Seeing none. So all those in favor. Thank you, that carries unanimously. Okay, next we, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the recommendation for the Community Planning and Partnerships Report 19125 on page 84 of your board package submitted by Superintendent Pachetti and Manager Ranzella. May I have a mover? Uh, <coughs> Trustee Gray, seconded by Trustee Reynolds. I will read the recommendation. Be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the list of schools for for community partnerships and that the staff be directed to notify community partners of opportunities for sharing of space and undertake the annual community planning and partnerships meeting. Is there any debate? <laughs> Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you. I was just wondering if you've set the date, time and location uh, and have sent out the uh, invitations to the members who are on the com uh, community planning and partnerships uh, listing to make them aware. I believe the uh, date and time is identified in the report, which is December 11th at seven o'clock. Uh, no, we have not sent anything out um, until trustees approve uh, the report. Uh, but as soon as that is done, we'll be uh, notifying all our community partners uh, <clears throat> via uh, letter and email, as well as uh, putting a, a, a notice in the newspapers uh, and also posting on our website. Sorry, just to follow up, just clarity, where is the meeting being held? Right Here. in our, at our, at uh, our meeting. Yes, yes. at Thanks. the committee of the whole meeting on December 11th. Okay, thank you. At the, at J, right here in this room. JWS. Okay, thank you. Just letting it out, no, letting people know so they can come on out. Okay, so uh, there are no more speakers on the speakers list. Uh, so we will now vote. All those in favor. That carries unanimously, thank you very much. Okay, now we're up to communications to the board. First off is item 5-1, student trustee reports. Trustee Slau and uh, Burns, do you have a report for us this evening? Yes, we do. Um, good evening, Director Miller, Chair Grabenz, fellow trustees and superintendents. We hope that everyone had a safe and happy October and Trustee Burns and I are very excited to give our fifth student trustee report tonight. Oh, yes, fifth. I'll begin by updating the board on all the endeavors that Trustee Burns and I have been working on, and then I'll pass it off to him to address our future plans. To begin, three weeks ago, we attended the Osta Eco Fall General Meeting, which was held in the Marriott Hotel in Toronto. We had an opportunity to network with many inspiring student trustees and hear many amazing initiatives that are being developed in other boards. We also heard from the CEO of EQAO, Nora Marsh, and Nancy Naylor, the Deputy Minister of Education. During these sessions, student trustees were given the chance to ask questions regarding tech, student success, and environmental concerns. After the conference, 
Trustee Burns and I selected our executive committee and we did not expect to receive 30 applications. This year has set the record of the highest number of executive applications that the Student Senate has ever had. And it's a testament to the increasing interest in student leadership in the HDSP. Um, we're extremely proud of all of our chosen executives and we look forward to working with all of them in the future. On another note, um, I'd like to update the board on our idea of potentially moving the Student Senate to Milton. At our last Student Senate meeting, a unanimous vote during the elementary session passed in favor of moving the Senate, but during the secondary senator session, the motion did not pass. Um, there was a strong opposition against a permanent move and an alternating option, and while many returning senators argued that the logistics would be too difficult. Uh, they also expressed concern that the alternate location would not provide us with inadequate space to hold Senate meetings. However, student trust, I mean, Trustee Burns and I uh, do not want to completely disregard this idea, um, given that the secondary senators who voted were mainly from Oakville and, Bur and Burlington. In terms of specifics, there were 27 Southern um, secondary senators and four Northern um, secondary senators. And we recognize that this conflicts with our priority of increasing Northern representation, and it creates an equity issue within our board. Um, um, as a response, um, I reached out to two, I mean, we reached out to two executives of our student council affairs, and we have begun to brainstorm the possibility of holding some sort of forum in Milton so that students are given the opportunity to share their ideas and get a sense of what the Senate does. So this forum will allow any student in the Milton or Halton Hills region to get a taste of student Senate and they'll have the opportunity to speak about important topics like drug policy, mental health and the environment. And this has already gained a lot of support from the Senate. And it's, an, uh, and it's a new avenue that has not been um, explored yet that will achieve student voice from all parts of Halton. Now I'll pass it off to student Trustee Burns. Thank you, Trustee Lau. I'll start off with a small summary of the conversation that was held between the student trustees, Associate Director Bogue and Director Miller this past Monday, November 4th. In accordance with a motion passed during our last board meeting, we had a conversation together to discuss a series of ideas relating to environmental initiatives in the board and how student voice could play a part in future events. As a group, we agreed on some future connections that might prove useful in relation to the work ahead and Trustee Lau and I are looking forward to establishing a more in-depth plan in the future that could gather extensive student opinion on environmental issues. We are also looking forward to welcoming Superintendent Puchetti and Suzanne Burwell to a future student senate meeting to speak with student senators about the current state of environmental initiatives within Halton. In relation to Superintendent Blackwell's PAR update, during the previous student senate meeting, student senator Edward, Edward Dinka from Robert Bateman, who is also the final student council president for his school, suggested that student senators from Nelson, Burlington Central, and Robert Bateman begin speaking to each other and possibly planning meetings between the student leadership groups of the respective schools. After our recent student senate meeting, Trustee Lau and I received a request from Mary Marshall, the system principal for equity and student health for student representation on the accessibility coordinating committee and the equity and inclusive education steering advisory committee. After a series of difficult decisions, we selected four very strong student senators who are advocates in equity and accessibility across their communities, who are all excited to represent the students of the HDSB to their respective committees. We would like to thank System Principal Marshall for her willingness to support student voice within the board. On the topic of student voice, the next student senate meeting on November 19th will include a discussion on the focus of the multi-year plan. We look forward to the opportunity to review issues that matter most to students, and Trustee Lau and I applaud this initiative to include students in the development of the future MYP. We will now accept any questions. Trustee Daniele. Thank you very much to you, Madam Chair. Um, I love the students and the meetings. I think they're the highlight of my month. Really, really enjoy them, but I really, I wanna commend you both um, not only for the largest number of applications to the executive, I think that really speaks to the leadership that you're showing at Student Senate, but also by the representation on Student Senate. And just for trustees' awareness, this is the first time, in the, my fourth term, this is the first time we've had representative from both the CPP program and Gary Allen on Student Senate. So you're increasing that diversity of voice and making sure to hear from everybody, and I just wanted to commend you for that. Trustee Gray. 
Thank you very much. I was uh, sitting here just formulating uh, my question, so I'm going to try and wing it now. <laughs> Not quite there. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much, student senators or, or student trustees, for giving us the student senator report. Um, and I know the work that you do is so very, very uh, critical. And, and tonight, there's been an extreme example of the importance of your voice here at the table. So, thank you. Um, I, I have to say that I'm disappointed um, at the result of the location, uh, as you might imagine. Um, I uh, know that there's probably not much representation that comes down from Halton Hills to this center here uh, for the student senator meetings. I had hoped that there would have been at least a chance to try it once at the Milton site so that everyone on the student senator group could see that it's uh, really a site that uh, could work for everyone. Um, so I commend you, however, that you are taking this on and taking it in another direction and perhaps uh, creating a forum whereby we may have uh, representation and involvement by those students who are um, in the northern areas of this board. Thank you. Okay, no other speakers on the speakers list. I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for your report. I, I admire your commitment uh, and your understanding that uh, looking at who's voting and how that's skewing the results of your vote and uh, com coming up with some possible solutions to help mitigate that. Um, and uh, also uh, great to hear that uh, You've already been meeting with uh, Director Miller and Associate Director Bogue about uh, moving forward on the environmental um, issues. And uh, also, it's great to hear that um, the, uh, the student uh, leadership at the three schools uh, are already, like, have taken the initiative themselves to, to work together to help make those transitions as positive as possible for the students coming in. So it's especially, uh, many of those students would be moving on this year probably, so they're doing that for students that are coming behind them and that's very admirable. So thank you very much. So now we are up to action items for November 20th. Sometimes we have items that meet established criteria to come to the board table twice before voting, but we have no action items uh, for the next meeting that meet this criteria. That doesn't mean that there won't be anything to do next meeting, there will be. Okay, we have two information items for this evening. The first is processes and supports for highly able, potentially gifted primary students, report 19127, uh, Superintendent Zonnefeld on page 89 of your board package. Go right ahead. Thank you and good evening through the Chair to Trustees. Uh, the actions in this report are an outcome of the Special Education Review. And the review has informed and affirmed our decisions about when best to assess the cognitive student abilities of students. This has resulted in staff designing a more efficient and equitable problem solving process for our highly able and potentially gifted uh, students. We are providing professional development for our primary teachers to help them better meet, meet the learning needs of our, uh, again, highly able and potentially gifted students in a regular class. We shared this process change with SEAC and received generally supportive feedback and valuable input. I met with the reps uh, from the Association for Bright Children in advance of the SEAC meeting to hear their questions and concerns. Uh, they'd like to see the board collect more data on the progress and well being of students, and they appreciated hearing that the primary self contained placement will continue. Staff will monitor the impact of these changes to ensure that we continue to meet the needs of our highly able and potentially gifted students. I'm happy to take any questions. So far we have one speaker and that is uh, Trustee Oliver. Thank you, through you Chair. Uh, thank you uh, Superintendent Zonneveld for this uh, report. I have a question for clarification around the fourth bullet point um, yeah, in the report. Uh, where I believe you're comparing the, um, the differences in the problem-solving processes for highly abled, potentially gifted students compared to the problem-solving processes for students with other uh, exceptionalities. Um, can you define or ex elaborate what you mean by problem-solving processes for those two populations of students? Uh, through the chair, so um, 
So you're, you're referring to um, how we pro problem solve and assess students uh, in those different groups. So our current process for uh, students in the primary grades is a nomination process um, for students who are potentially gifted. So teachers in SK and grade one mostly are uh, asked to uh, nominate students who might uh, potentially score high enough to be to identified as gifted um, uh, by our psychological staff. Uh, all other students of all other potential exceptionalities, uh, even not even exceptionality, but just as a part of that problem solving, follow a problem solving pathway that uh, involves uh, parents and school staff in uh, working together to determine what might be the needs of students and how to meet those needs. Uh, and there are many potential possibilities in there. That problem solving pathway is laid out in several places in our working together uh, booklet, in our uh, special education plan. Uh, it's available on, the, on our uh, board website uh, in schools, etc. cetera. So uh, that's what's different currently and with this change, uh, we're no longer doing that nomination process. Instead, uh, the uh, potentially gifted students, highly able students, would be included in that same problem-solving pathway as other students. Trustee Shuttleworth. Hi, thank you through the chair to Superintendent Zonenfeld. When does this change start? So th this will be effective this year. So normally uh, primary teachers would begin that nomination process uh, in December uh, so that uh, they would, then our psychological staff would start uh, assessing students uh, through the winter. It takes about a month for our, our, our psych staff to do that. So the change means that instead of that being just one time in the year where that can happen, uh, the problem solving pathway is accessible to um, students and families and staff at any time during the year. So, uh, which might, may result in potentially assessments if that's what's deemed necessary, uh, but it's not restricted by time anymore. So it's effective this year uh, to take advantage of that. Okay, so you no one on the speaker's list. Uh, I just have, um, uh, well, a, a point and then a sort of a confirmation. Um, I really appreciate the extensive review that's happened here. Uh, and I also appreciate that now that you're, you're suggesting that the, um, that the process align with other exceptionalities. Um, it, it, the other way that was happening felt, uh, seemed like we were looking, like fishing for exceptionalities in the gifted Area. And um, I, I, I think that this uh, treating exceptionalities in the same way is a, a very equitable way to, to approach this. Um, the other thing that I just wanted a confirmation on is that we aren't looking to get rid of primary uh, self-contained classes, are we? No. Uh, the primary self-contained placement will continue to be an option uh, for schools and families to consider through the school resource team process, uh, which would eventually you know, be confirmed through IPRC. So it continues to be an option. Through Chair Durbance, uh to uh, Superintendent Zonnefeld, thank you for your work on this and thank you for leading this. And I also want to thank the Board of Trustees. Uh, I, I can't remember how long ago it was now, three, maybe four years ago, the, the board approved uh, finances for a review of special education with the intent to make our services better for our students. Uh, and I think we are uh, pleased with the report's findings and the recommendations that they've made to us as staff. And we've implemented uh, some of them and we'll implement others. And there, there'll be some that will take some time. This is one of them, um, one of their recommendations based on their report, uh, a third party report, um, which I think is important for the pub public to understand. Uh, this, these were uh, people that uh, we RFP'd to do this, who are experts in this area to provide advice and consultation with the board. And so I appreciate the Board of Trustees for supporting that 
process. It certainly helps us. And um, um, so thank you. Uh, there will still be um, some um, confusion, perhaps, maybe not confusion, but misunderstanding around the process going into December from some parents and so on. We will be, Superintendent Zonnefeld will be meeting with all our elementary principals. I've informed the uh, presidents of ATFO, uh, the union executive at ATFO today around this change so that they're aware of it. And we will help our principals and our kindergarten teachers with communications around this change in, in processes. And uh, so um, I expect that trustees may hear at some point around this or some of the people that might not quite understand the difference. Uh, so we will also help trustees with some speaking notes on how to, uh, to deal with those kinds of things uh, as we get into the process in December. Thanks. Oh, we have another speaker on the speaker's list, Trustee Collard. Hi, thank you. Um, through you to um, Superintendent Donafeld. Uh We've had conversations at the SEAC table and at this board table in the past about trying to get all of these students in elementary together in one school in Burlington. And I'm wondering if any progress has been made on that. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Collard, uh, we continue to look at that. It's uh, a complicated uh, challenge. Uh, I know, you know, we, we have spoken about that a few times, and uh, the challenge for sure is that space is so limited in Burlington. So if we were to try to bring um, grades one to eight together in one location, uh, we don't have schools that would have that capacity. So we continue to talk with planning, but um, certainly we would be hesitant to make a change in where we are locating our self-contained classes, uh, a change that would in essence put a school over capacity significantly, which would um, you know, cause some significant accommodation pressures. So that is, uh, I know you've, you've expressed that desire, um, you know, the current accommodation uh, options in Burlington make that quite difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Trustee Shuttleworth. Sorry, thank you through the chair to you, Superintendent Zonneveld. Following on from Trustee Collard's question. So if you're looking at moving it to one, that's an option, but not a possible option. You, however, are looking at splitting the cohort in secondary school in Burlington. So currently, the gifted program resides solely in Nelson, but with the program accommodation review, you're now splitting between the north and the south to provide more accommodation for those students. So I don't, I don't understand how that works because if you think of elementary schools being smaller, um, the secondary schools being larger, how are you justifying a split if optimally you had the program all in one elementary school in Burlington? Uh, through your chair, advance to Trustee Shuttleworth and, and Superintendent Zonnefeld, that was a result of the, the Burlington PAR. Uh, and one of the um, uh, recommendations in the PAR was that we would survey and um, consult with the parents and of the of students of who are identified gifted uh, around a single site uh, originally in the par we had suggested that there be two sites one at nelson and one at mm robinson um, through trustee collard um, she asked that we delay that until we, I can't remember how it all played out, but delay that until we had consulted with the communities, which we, we agreed to. And we did go out and consult with the communities. And those living north of the QEW wanted to go to MM, and those south of the QEW wanted to go to Nelson. So uh, it's, it's not dissimilar to what goes on in Oakville at the moment. Uh, Halton Hills and Milton are different because, just because they're smaller. But uh, where the, they can be that way, but um, students still have an option of going to 
one or the other, but we, we won't necessarily provide transportation to one or the other um, unless they're in the north catchment area or the south catchment area, then they would get transportation. But if they are in the north and they want to go to the south, by, they can go, but we won't provide transportation. Um, and so that came out of those consultations. So that's how that all developed. And I'll let Superintendent e um, uh, Zonnefeld talk about how that meshes with the elementary. Uh, through the chair to uh, Trustee Shuttleworth. Uh, the difference uh, between what you're asking about and what tr uh, Trustee Collard is asking is that uh, she's asking about combining the, the pr elementary all into one site, whereas the secondary is creating two sites that service students in 9 to 12. I reckon. She's, I she's reckon. Not, yeah, she's not asking about serving the uh, elementary students in two sites, one to eight. She's asking we'll bring them all together in one site, one to eight. No, follow so up. It's, so I do, I so do recognize that, but what my, my question kind of is on is the idea that if you have one school, one elementary school in Burlington, Charles Bedouin, which is the school where self-contained gifted classes are for four to eight or whatever it is to eight, so you have a cohort in one school, in one elementary school, that will now be split into two secondary schools. How are you, and again, I know that you backfill, but how are you justifying the split in population to two schools in the numbers, is my kind of question. Through you, Chair Drabentz, to... Uh... Trustee Shuttleward, we're justifying because that's what came out of the consultation, is to create the two sites. But in secondary school, um, at secondary schools, students identified gifted are in a site, and it's backfilled with what, students who are the highly able, and then they get combined into one class. So that's, that's why we did this. Um, it was our original recommendation, and then we were asked to consult, so we consulted, and, and it kind of confirmed what our, I, maybe confirmation's not the right word, but it, 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 uh, it supported what we had originally thought was the best process. So that's, that's really the justification. Uh, Mark? Okay. Okay. Oh, good. So uh, there are no more speakers on the speakers list. Thank you very much. And now we're up to the operational plan, report 19126, Associate Director Bogue, page 91 of your board package. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the board, it's my pleasure to uh, provide an update on the operational plan. I'd like to just start by thanking trustees for being uh, so supportive of our multi-year plan and resourcing our operational plan each year. It's uh, through that budget process and that resourcing of the plan that allows us to do the work that we uh, do. And I'd like to just acknowledge the superintendents uh, around the outer circle as well who uh, lead much of this work and also acknowledge the folks in our school and our central departments. It's really work that happens in concert that makes uh, good things happen for our students in our classrooms. Um, as in the past, I'd like to just highlight a few areas of our operational plan for you. You've got the details in the package, and we're going to try to get through this. Um, we haven't rehearsed this, but we're going to try to get through it in about five minutes or so, and all the superintendents are going to uh, just speak briefly to their slide. So, um, and I'll do the clicking. Uh, the overview, this is the same overview that you've seen in, seen in years gone by. Uh, really the, the nine quadrants there, we're trying to highlight some pieces from each of those quadrants for you. Um, and we'll start with uh, Superintendent Salmini. So this slide highlights for you uh, grade three reading achievement in EQAO. And the blue bars uh, represent the percentage of students that have met the provincial standard. Um, and again, the bars go over time. The yellow line represents our target. And so as you can see, we have shown uh, growth uh, in this area and we are very close uh, to our uh, multi-year plan target. We're gonna continue uh, strategies that we have in place. 
uh, continuing to support comprehensive literacy programs in our school, uh, focusing on emergent literacy, really looking at that connection between oral language development and reading, um, and monitoring individual student achievement um, and creating intervention plans for struggling uh, learners. This next slide uh, maybe requires a little more uh, explanation because we're actually trying to see those blue bars go down. So uh, our goal here was to narrow the gap between the achievement of our um, regular, regularly developing students, our students without an IEP, and our students with IEPs. So you're not seeing here the actual achievement levels of students of either group. What you're seeing is the gap between the, the scores of those two groups on their EQAO scores and how we're doing in terms of that gap. So for example, if the gap between those two groups of students in an area such as grade three EQAO reading, if that gap is 40%, our goal of reducing it by 25% would drop it by 10%. If you, I hope that makes sense. So what we're trying to do, and because the, the gap varies across all of the different uh, assessments in EQAO, we didn't go uh, area, you know, score by score to identify a specific amount. Instead, we said, let's try and reduce that gap by 25% across all uh, assessment areas. So these are two areas to show you how where we're trying to uh, get down to that 25% reduction, which is the yellow line across these bar graphs, and how we've made that, uh, close that gap uh, over the four years in each of those areas. Uh, if you look deeper into the, the report that has been shared with you, the, the fully comprehensive one, you can see that we have narrow that gap in a number of areas. Some areas have been a bit flat, um, and we need to work more in those areas because we haven't been able to narrow that enough. Uh, you can see we've made some headway. This is me. Uh, the good news here is we've laid a foundation and structure in all of our schools to address well-being via our well-being teams that are now in all schools, coupled with all schools now having well-being goals in their school improvement plans. This sounds easier, but it, it's actually taken us uh, two or three years just to get to that point. The challenge here, as you can see uh, by the remaining gap, has been coherence. Uh, schools currently, they're all choosing varying approaches and strategies around well-being. We now have an active steering committee looking at increasing board-wide system expectations around well-being in future years. So this would mean a more coordinated and aligned or system-wide push across our system versus a very school-based approach now. Um, to get system results, we think we need basically a very system-based focus. So we're putting together uh, kind of all-in approaches that will be taking a more efficacious approach um, in our system around ensuring all schools are implementing these um, core set of, of uh, approaches and strategies in the, in the years ahead. And we think we'll get uh, better traction. Thank you. And 100% of central departments will create cross-departmental teams. So I'd like to shine the light on the work that was done this past year between the facilities department and the program department who worked very closely together. We created a, a, a guide to facilities and programs for our secondary administrators to try and make very clear how it is that we work together, who you call for what, what extra considerations you need when making decisions around um, program enhancements in terms of the equipment within your buildings, that call before you dig manual um, that is very helpful for men in schools. We also worked together uh, and included the health and safety department in working together on the AP that recently came to the board on the use of technological equipment in general tech 
in general education areas. And so in both cases, it highlights the work that has occurred between the academic and the corporate side. Uh, this uh, slide represents uh, the uh, update, uh, which is missing for 1819 on the slide. We just realized it doesn't show the bar, uh, but it is good news in terms of the school generated funds that are uh, received through the online system. Uh, we have increased by 11% to 65% of school generated funds being collected online in 1819. Uh, also, the online registration has gone up from 76% the prior year to 91% uh, of our families have an online account. Um, also, if we take into account that some of the revenue sources are received uh, through uh, electronic funds transfer, so outside of the uh, online system, but also not in cash or checks, uh, and if we consider that, we are at about 70% uh, of the school generated funds uh, being received through an online or electronic funds uh, transfer payment type. Initiative that um, was undertaken um, last year had to do with uh, creating this whole uh, this whole role of equity leads. So uh, at each one of our schools, we have uh, at least one uh, equity lead teacher that is supported centrally. Uh, a number of our schools have, have self-supported a number of other uh, uh, teachers to, uh, to attend a four-part learning session where they're withdrawn for some pretty intensive training uh, over the course of the year in a variety of different topics. Um, are really uh, connected to our uh, equity action strategy. Um, uh, looking at, uh, at core concepts related, uh, related to inclusion, um, racism, um, and uh, then taking that information, building their capacity, taking it back to their schools uh, in, in order to share and, and train staff within their local sites. So it's a way that, that we're really trying to broaden our reach and also be very efficient with our, with our limited resources while doing so. So we are in the third year of administration with the Have Your Say survey. Uh, trustees will note that all stakeholder, the responses have increased. Uh, last year we had another survey in our system for students as well called Tell Them From Me. That survey will no longer exist. So we, the survey fatigue for our, our uh, students and our staff will uh, hopefully reduce with that and we will uh, continue to modify the survey as we uh, develop the next multi-year plan. You'll notice that French was added as a response to some of the questions we were getting and then trustees asked us to add a question a few years ago in the second administration in terms of how is the community hearing about the survey. Uh, we did not use a newspaper ad last year uh, because we had uh, such, we, I think we had two responses the year prior. Uh, we did increase our social media outreach and uh, had a significant increase. I think there were 23 people that had heard about it through social media. And given the small sample size, it's, uh, or the small uh, population that, that responded, it's a good, good response rate. Thank you, and this is our stewardship and resources goal. 100% of our learning environments will be technology enabled. Um, and just to let trustees know that last year we installed in excess of 200 new projectors in our classrooms and pur purchased more than 2,000 devices for our students and staff. And these are just numbers that um, were supplied through our ICT rollout budget. Certainly schools also purchased um, a lot more resources in this using their own, um, whether it be uh, fundraising dollars or decentralized funds. Um, and uh, in our last year, we are up to, we believe, um, approximately 90% of our learning environments are um, technology enabled, and that, that's th short throw projectors, um, laptops, um, good Wi Fi. Um, and just to let you know, trustees, that we continue, we made a commitment a couple years ago to continue to do spot testing um, at schools each and every month, and um, it continues this year uh, for September and October that um, all of the frequency tests have come back well below the recommended uh, acceptable frequency. Thank you. Great. And uh, our focus on innovation about improving a process, product, or understanding, both on the corporate side as well as the academic side in our schools and in our um, business wings. Um, it really is an equity um, of opportunity. Uh, we believe that the work of shift and 
Brotman's I Think strategies um, uh, focusing on pro-pro and causal modeling and working through school programs. We've been able to really capture um, the excitement of staff, um, folks that participate in this program, 94% said they, they totally bought into a culture of try, fail, learn, and shift, and that uh, they did receive support for that with their leaders. So we, we do feel we're making headway. You can see today in um, the iSTEM as one example of that enthusiasm and how that's working. And in addition, we've also talked about moving away from barracks as uh, cafeteria tables, but instead to baristas. We're talking about, you saw some of those vertical walls instead of blackboards, and talking about chill spaces and flexible seating. So those are the pieces that we continue to work on and build an understanding of rooms that are wonder and create and think. Okay, before, oh, we have questions, but just before we do questions, it is 10 o'clock, so we have to have a motion uh, you moving to have a motion to extend. Uh, seconded by uh, Trustee Oliver. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, also a quick discussion. Don't worry, the other list is still around. Quick discussion on how long do we need um, half... Oh. We have to go back into private, so we have to keep that in mind. So another, let's say half an hour, go to 10.30. Okay, any other discussion on that? No, we're good. Okay, so we're gonna motion to extend. All those in favor to extend for 30 minutes. And that carries unanimously. I'm impressed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we'll go back to the other list here. And Trustee Amos. Thank you. And I'd like to thank um, all of our senior admin for their information tonight because I think we have made significant progress as a board. And I'd like to say that I'm very proud to be part of the board and that our multi-year plan has been moved forward through this operational plan. Um, I, I mean, we did set some really lofty goals last time and now that we have more information, I believe we'll be able to set, be able to have more research-based um, knowledge to um, set targets the next time around. But I do have a question um, regarding the seasonal well-being um, survey, uh, Superintendent Padraberg in secondary, and um, I just wonder, is there a clear understanding of what well-being is when students answer that question? Because depending on where you are or what you're doing or what's happened that day, you can answer differently. So is there an education piece needed or is there a, a rewording of the question or a clarity with an explanation, um, something, because uh, sometimes it's apples and oranges, and so what is there may not be what is the actual number. And I do appreciate that you've already laid a foundation so that in the future we'll be able to um, maybe have a more system-wide um, approach to it generally, but I'm just wondering about that understanding piece. I think, yes, I think you've nailed it. Uh, it. There's a bit of a disconnect there. I mean, the ministry just four years ago has kind of come out with four different pillars around well-being. Um, I'm not sure our kids, any of them, <laughs> understand fully what those are. What are the definitions? Um, what is my expectation, you know, for well-being? Am I happy all the time? Is it, you know, so we, we do struggle with that. And it is something we... Um, I, th I think the more we look at it and survey and look at what interventions are, are you know, really moving the needle, which schools have experienced success, what are the areas to really push, and maybe some areas to, to not do anymore. Um, we're learning more and more as we look at it, but through, through our surveying, we're, all, we're sharpening have your say all the time looking at it um, in terms of how we ask kids and do they understand. Um, it, it, it's a challenge around these areas. And what is your expectation of well-being, right? I mean, we all experience times where we, we feel we are 
or times we feel we're not? And, and how do you net that out in a survey, right? It, it's a challenge. Can I just follow up for one second? If it's really quick, it is. So thank you for that. Um, just so you know, I don't think if you're doing it on a scale of five and five is you're ha really, really happy, I don't think I never ever go to the extreme on any scale. And I know that's a bad thing, but I mean, it's because I'm trying to be realistic about what is. So I think we do need to educate our students about what, what it is. And so I, I like to ask if that could be a piece of it when we're looking forward in the future that somehow we can educate so that they understand what they're being asked. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Oliver. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so I've been uh, very pleased with um, seeing the work um, of, of, of our staff in, in making our multi-year plan for 2016, 2020 come alive through the operational plan and watching the progress through um, our progress reports. I think we've, our staff are doing excellent work in all the areas um, in all the themes that we have identified. Uh, tonight, I, I would like to focus specifically on, on the equity and well-being piece uh, to which uh, Superintendent Porter Barrick spoke to. And that is the specific goal of increasing um, a sense of personal well-being uh, for students in the secondary level. When I look at um, the fact that just barely half of our secondary students indicated last year that they had a sense of personal well-being, I find that quite distressing and upsetting. And, and I appreciate that our schools are doing a lot in the area of mental health. And there are many wonderful strategies um, happening at our schools. Um, but appreciating how closely tied sense of personal well-being is to each student's experience of their school life, um, to their sense of belonging to the school community and the community at large and their academic achievement. It's important that we uh, really look at this um, through a more standardized way, I'm, I'm thinking. And I wonder if we've done any research into what are, the, what are some proven strategies that work specifically with this um, secondary student population, specifically in a school setting, so that we can implement those and, and have proven results. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Trustee Oliver, maybe I can start, and Superintendent Potter Barrick will certainly jump in, or maybe some others. I think one of the challenges that we are dealing with right now is uh, what is well being? And well being, um, I think right now we've got several questions that we ask students because it's a bit of an aggregate. It's, it's a whole variety of things. It, 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 we often go to mental uh, wellness as sort of a first go to, there's physical health in there in terms of their well being screen time, how much exercise they get, uh, alcohol and drug addiction issues, all those pieces. So I, I think one of the learnings that we found over the course of this multi-year plan is this really is an aggregate measure and our thinking as it evolves may not even be the same as what the kids are perceiving as well. So we're gonna have to define that a little bit more um, clearly, I think. And so I think your question is, can we, you know, can we get some more research-based data on how do we define it. We've got a definition from the ministry. We've done some work. Uh, what uh, Superintendent Padre Barrick uh, alluded to in the, his present uh, portion of the presentation is we are working on defining that for our system in terms of what are those expected practices that we uh, would expect in every classroom, including, you know, a sense of in feeling included, including, uh, you know, a behavior in the classroom, uh, kids feeling that they belong, safe, all of those things, and trying to define that for our staff as well. And I think that's where we might see some traction in terms of how we change the environment for kids, um, how we uh, impact how kids treat other kids and, and those kinds of things. But certainly to your, your notion around, you know, the research piece, I think we can, there are some things that we can learn there as well. I, I would just add to that as well. I mean, and I, I don't think I'm telling anybody in this room, anything they don't already know, but these aren't just Halton challenges. These are uh, Canadian challenges, uh, North American and even global challenges. These are all um, marker points with our youth that are, are struggling now. So, I mean, even sometimes holding the line on these um, 
is a bit of a, a victory right now because I don't think I don't think we figured it out yet. Trustee Shuttleworth. I'm sorry, I'll follow up. Go ahead, you yeah. have about 50 seconds. Yep. So, so thank you very much for that. And, and, and I think precisely because it is a, a more of a global issue, um, all the more, I think, reason um, that there will be um, some, some standardized res, uh, research findings and, and, um, and suggestions or recommendations that, that we can put forward. And, and I think it's important to, to look at the research and look at the data and explore that so that we're not just kind of creating things that we think are good, but that we're creating things that we know are proven um, to have success. Okay, Trustee Shuttleworth, go ahead. Thank you, through the chair to, I think, Associate Director Bogue. Um, so in looking at these targets, oh, I know we're only three years into the four-year plan, but although I've seen such wonderful things going on in the schools around, there are many goals that aren't being achieved. Um, as an outsider looking in, they are going to see that we have not achieved our goals and will not be able to see what we as trustees see going on in the schools and the communities around us. My question is, how do we reflect on the factors that have, may have impeded our achievements and further ensure that the progress we make as a school board is reflected in the achievement of targets set out, set out in our upcoming multi-year plan? Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Trustee Shuttleworth, and through the chair to all trustees. I think it's a good question. It's, uh, you know, we're in our third year right now of a four-year plan. Um, so I would say that we set our targets with that four-year window. So we are three-quarters of the way through. Um, there are a number of things in our plan that were new for us. And with new initiatives, often there's a, a bit of a, uh, an implementation dip or there's a, a challenge gathering momentum. And so we might tend to see some slower growth at the beginning of a plan with more growth near the end. Uh, that's not, I'm not making excuses. That might be the case in some circumstances. We, um, we uh, I think we'll want to review moving forward how we set our targets. Target setting is really difficult work. How do we set targets that are gonna push us as an organization to move forward in an area, but be realistic? Uh, how do we set them so that they will be a, a bit of a stretch goal for us and not be set too, uh, too far out there that they'll never be achieved? So I think there's some learning there for us in that area. For example, when we um, developed this multi-year plan, uh, the trustees were supportive of us uh, identifying a number of areas that we had never measured before. In fact, I think I counted about 13 in this plan. And we set targets for those areas, and we had no baseline for those areas. And I mean, I give the board kudos for identifying things that we should go after because they were important things for us to go after. But we didn't have a measure to start with. So that makes it really tricky to, to choose a target. And in fact, we chose some targets that were unattainable. For example, once we got a baseline in the one area, I think it was one of the HR practices, we found we were in the 90s and we had set a target of a 10% improvement, for example. So that, so there's some learning there for us. Let's try to understand what our, where we are, get a sense of a baseline before we set our targets. So some of those things I think we can, we can certainly uh, learn from moving forward. Um, so what I would suggest or recommend moving forward for our next multi-year plan as we're in the process now is once we've identified those big areas that we want to focus on, we maybe take a little bit more time with our research department to help us. Let's see where are we now. Let's determine some baselines. What's a reasonable um, stretch goal for us over the next four years? Um, and take a little bit more time in determining those, those, those targets. There's clearly some things in here that we've struggled with, regardless of what the target is. And I think that's okay. We know there are some areas that are really tough and we grind them out. But there are some other areas where I think our targets could be set a little bit more, more realistically perhaps, and I think our research department will, will uh, add a lot of value to that process. So that would be my suggestion moving forward. Okay, final speaker is Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thank you, uh, through you Madam Chair, and just building on Trustee Shuttleworth's comments, Mine were gonna be uh, very similar. One of the things that would be useful, I think from my perspective in these reports is to identify 
during the presentation what those single biggest barriers are through your analysis of what's going on in the system and raise those as part of what's coming forward with the numbers just so we can have a sense of that because some of them my sense is right now you know we're in uncertain times some of them may be external factors some of them may be internal factors but these are the kinds of things that we ask our students to do we want them to try fail learn the whole innovation cycle that we talk about so i'd like to see us reflecting that in our um, reporting as well just so uh, it feels more transparent to me uh, and a as a learning organization i think it would be okay thank you that's i think that's fair feedback we can certainly take that back Okay, if there are no more speakers on the speakers list, thank you very much, Associate Director Bogue and all the staff for all the work that you're doing. Uh, these are, of course, long-term goals, and uh, it's great getting reports on them every year, but it also lays the foundation for our next multi-year plan and next operational plan. We will have baselines for a lot of these things now, so that's great work going forward. Okay, so... <clears throat> we are now up to notice of notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none. Director's report. Go ahead, Director Miller. Thank you, Chair Vance. So I don't have too many t uh, topics tonight. The first one is uh, it was well publicized in the newspapers and on the radio and so on. November 1st was the beginning of a cell ban phone in schools. Cell phone, cell phone, a, a cell phone ban. <laughs> it's been a long night. Um, as uh, Superintendent Pachetti said. <laughs> um, and uh, we had to develop, according to the province uh, policy slash admin procedure or whatever, we had to recognize it. I think there's some misunderstandings about the difference between policies and procedures and so on. But we have included our cell phone uh, comments in our code of conduct for all students. So I'll turn it over to Superintendent Padraberry to talk about that. Practically very little changed it. You know, Friday became Monday and, and really nothing changed in our schools. I think I, I think there are a few um, people on the polarized end of this issue that may have wanted uh, a bigger shift in practice, but we have already been aligned with what the new policy states and have been for years. And, that's it, and that is that teachers set the parameters for cell phone use in their schools and it's always been around instruction um, and that's the way it is now that is the language of of the new for uh, regulations so there are no school-wide bans um, on cell phones that apply to lunch rooms or playgrounds or it's just not it's not what the spirit of the PPM the ministry put out is so Really, um, it's been business as, as usual with us. I think we had a few questions for from people maybe hopeful that um, it was something more or, or less than it was, but it, it is what are currently in place in our schools. Second item, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Nagoya around timing of a uh, deficit recovery. Thank you for the chair. Um, at as part of the 1920 budget process, a new requirement was for trustees to approve a, a deficit recovery plan uh, for a compliant budget. That requirement is also in place for the revised estimates. Revised estimates are required to be submitted to the ministry by December 13th. And as we do not have a second board meeting in December, we will be bringing forward a draft uh, deficit recovery plan to trustees on the, uh, at the December 4th meeting to be approved uh, at the uh, December 11th uh, special meeting. And then, as with pra past practice, we'll be bringing a full report on revised estimates and the final deficit recovery plan on January 8th. And we have received ministry approval for this approach. Any questions at all? The third item is... Uh, um, there's been some interest generated over the last probably couple years. We've been approached, uh, I've been approached, Superintendent Puccetti's been approached. 
by businesses or um, organizations prepared to um, or inquire with us around the possibility of putting up domes on some of our our pitches. Uh, that's fields for those unacquainted with that terminology. Um, um, so uh, we've had quite a lot of interest generated, and we felt it was time to uh, issue an RFI. So I will turn it over to Superintendent Puccetti to elaborate on that. Sure. Thank you very much, Director Miller. Um, as you know, not uh, school boards have limited funding to do these kinds of projects. So uh, there are a fair amount of school boards in Ontario that have um, uh, gone uh, towards uh, finding an organization uh, to operate, to build and operate a dome and artificial turf sports facility. So for us, the first step in this process is to issue what's called a, a request for expression of interest. And we'll be um, issuing this to, in a variety of different ways, uh, we're, we're going to contact sports club organizations. Um, we may even put something in the newspaper. Uh, we'll put it through our tendering process. So we're just trying to find out who out there might be interested in um, uh, building and operating a dome at one of our secondary schools. I have been in touch with the um, uh, four municipality um, uh, senior people who are involved in our reciprocal agreement, mainly Parks and Recs people, to let them know we're interested and also in case they have any contacts that could forward towards us. So we're going to issue that uh, and then we can come back and uh, update you on what we find. And then the next step after that would be a more formal process done through procurement, uh, which would be a, um, a request for proposal uh, at specific sites, so um, we'll keep you posted. That concludes my report. Okay, excellent. So moving on to communications from the chair. Uh, so just a few points. Um, letter to the Minister of Education regarding the pro-grant changes went out on November 1st. I've asked um, manager group maker to uh, include it in our next board package. Um, we have, uh, just a side note, we have still yet to receive any responses from any of our letters from either minister, the former and the current minister, regarding any of the topics that we've sent. Um, also, uh, just to let you know that uh, I have been um, looking into the Near North District School Board's Ombudsman Report recommendations and have um, and will be getting an opinion back soon, um, but nothing yet. And uh, just a reminder, and I'm sure you're all aware, that the uh, Halton Learning Foundation Benefit Bash is tomorrow evening. Um, check your email, your, your table number is probably there. And uh, looking forward to talking and uh, socializing with all sorts of people and uh, hearing about the great works of the Halton Learning Foundation. Uh, so now we're on to committee reports. Are there any committee reports? Trustee Shuttleworth. Mine is super quick. CF met last night for their November meeting. Um, really two points. Um, to let people know, Maximum City came to talk to SEAC and get their input for the upcoming multi-year plan. And SEAC also looked at topics of interest for future meetings. Um, top of the list were bullying, EA support, unidentified students with IEPs. And next SEAC meeting, there will be a presentation on the outdoor classroom at Nelson and Bateman. That was it. Thank you. Trustee Oliver. Uh, thank you. The Accessibility Committee met uh, last week, and as you've heard from Student Trustee Burns, we now this committee now has a student rep from uh, the Student Senate, and specifically from the Community Pathways uh, Program, which is wonderful. Also, this committee now has a SEAC rep, and that's um, Lou Morris, who's the uh, chair of SEAC. Um, next um, up is the uh, review of the annual operational plan, which uh, we are planning to put on the CX agenda for December to be done by the Accessibility Committee. Thank you. 
Trustee Gray. Thank you very much. I just want to invite all trustees to the next audit committee meeting being held next Tuesday, the 12th from two to 5 p.m. here at JWS. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we're up to, uh, do you have anything for, no, it's okay. Um, we're up to trustee questions and comments. Trustee Daniele. Thank you, I just wanted to express my thanks to all the trustees that uh, went to London this past weekend for the joint meeting between the Western Region and the Central West Region of OPSPA. Um, Halton always has a really good turnout at these meetings and I appreciate it. I know it was out of the way and it was a Saturday, uh, but I certainly appreciate everyone who was there. Great, um, see no one's on this, also on the speakers list, I just wanna mention a really important notice and that is there are skunks in the lower parking lot, so please be very careful. Yes. So don't poke them with the stick. <laughs> yes, just just go. Get to your car, go. Okay. Um, anyways, <laughs> so considering um, we've exhausted our agenda for a public session, so we need we need to rise and reconvene into private session. We have a five minutes. Okay, so is there any uh, discussion at all on rising and reconvening? Okay. All those in favor? Oh, yeah, I need a mover and a shaker. Okay, uh, Trustee Amos, Trustee Garretts, thank you very much. Rising, reconvening. Please vote. That carries uh, unanimously. We are now going into private session. Could any everybody please, who's not in private session, please uh, leave as quickly as possible so we can get this done. There's hundreds of them down there. you sent them?